used actually quite thick prongs almost that went into the brain and they were quite solid and so if the brain moved they could potentially cause damage. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello there, very good morning to you. Six o'clock on the dot, Monday, 26th of February. You're tuned into breakfast here on GB News. Eamon and Isabel. Divisions within the Conservative Party deepen as the Prime Minister faces a red wall backlash over Lee Anderson's sacking. However, one former party chairman hits out arguing the Tory party has been dragged into the gutter. Leveling up in action or another broken promise. The government set to announce today a £4.7 billion local transport fund for the North and the Midlands. We'll be joined by the Transport Secretary himself, Mark Harper, at the end of the hour. The nation's favourite supermarkets named will be revealing who's on top for the third year in a row. And later on, 20 past seven, as Angela Rain has been forced to defend herself over selling her council house for profit, we'll be debating the future of right to buy. And in the sport this morning, Liverpool win the Carabao Cup with kids. Lonely Maidstone take on Coventry in the FA Cup tonight and England fight back in the fourth test against India, but it looks like it's all just a little bit too late. It's a fine start to the week for many of us with some sunny spells on offer, but how long will it last for? Join me later to find out all the details. OK, so uh, we're leading today on the row over claims of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party, and that deepens today. According to the Telegraph newspaper, they've seen leaked WhatsApp messages from some Tory MPs who've raised concerns over Mr Anderson's suspension. MPs fear they could see a revolt from voters who will now move to the Reform Party after being flooded with supportive messages uh, on Lee Anderson. However, Baroness Saeed Varsi, a former party chairwoman and the first Muslim cabinet member, now appear in the House of Lords, has accused the Conservatives of being dragged into the gutter as she criticises the party's response to this latest crisis. OK, so what about this whole issue? We want to know your views on this mm -hmm. uh, this morning. Is it getting out of control or has Number 10 taken the correct course of action? Well, let's uh, discuss all of this with former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley, and the former Labour advisor, Mike Buckley. Good morning to both of you. Morning. Um, first of all, to you, Charlie, as a sort of Conservative representative, I suppose, here this morning. We saw Oliver Dowd and the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday saying that Ling Anderson had the whip removed not because of what he said, but because he refused to apologise for it. Was he right to say that? Uh, yes, yes, he should have been um, given the opportunity. Well, he was given the opportunity to apologise and he should have taken that opportunity. Mm. Um, and if he was able to clarify what he meant by what he was trying to say, then he should have he should have done so. But he failed to do so and didn't feel he needed to. Uh, you know, the comments were clearly um, uh, uh, clumsy at best, um, uh, you know, for whatever the failings 
of Sadiq Khan, of which there are a plenty, um, uh, but I won't sort of um, uh, go into those uh, unnecessarily just yet. Um, but the idea that the Mayor of London is uh, being led by or in cahoots with uh, extremists and uh, uh, fundamentalists is, is just simply not right. So the opportunity. How do you, how do you know it's not right? Uh, well, you don't. I, I, you have an opinion. You say, this doesn't seem like right, and if we were all fair-minded, we wouldn't say this sort of thing. My point about Lee Anderson, I'm not in the business of defending them or anything else, but I have not seen one interview since this all broke out where someone has looked into the fact, has he got a point? Well, I think th there's, there's clearly um, a sentiment shared across the country with what Lee was saying. There's clearly failings uh, on, the mayor, on behalf of the Mayor of London. So when you see things like From the River to the Sea broadcast and plastered across not just any old building, but Parliament, uh, which does incite uh, uh, and stoke community tensions, when that is a phrase that does cause concern for particularly Israeli community and the Jewish community in this country, failing to act on things like that for, does sit with the Mayor of London and the Metropolitan Police, and he has failed fundamentally to do that. But do I think um, the Mayor of London, or does anybody think that the Mayor of London is being led by um, uh, uh, you know, Islamic extremists? Uh, no, I, I don't think that is correct. And that's why I think um, uh, Lee... He didn't Shinnebuck exactly say that. He said there was a, a, a strong, too strong an influence and that Khan was relying too much on this. Do we know, and I just want to turn to Mike Buckley, um, former Labour advisor on this one, uh, do we know that to be true? Are you both, are you both anti... Lee Anderson on this one. I mean, I've obviously anti Lee Anderson on this one. I mean, what he said was that um, Sadiq and the capital were being controlled by Islamic extremists. There's zero evidence for that. No evidence for that at all. I mean, it was it was a racist comment. And for once, Richard Sunday did the right thing by removing the whip. Now, admittedly, some Conservative MPs and their WhatsApp thread were having a panic because they've had probably about three emails each from constituents saying we're not going to vote I, I, you anymore. I don't, I mean, but I, it doesn't I, take I, anything I, away from the fact no, that the I comments were racist. That might be wrong. Well, I don't get the fact that it's necessarily racist. Let's just say we were all sitting in Dubai and there was some sort of huge Christian influence uh, comes to fore in the, in the government of, of, of Dubai. There would be outroar. It doesn't make it. Um, uh, what, what did you say it was there? Um, but the comments would need to bear some relation to reality, and in this instance, they don't. And it's also a kind of classic, you know, anti-Islamic thing to say, as evidenced by the fact that Suella Braverman said basically the same thing about the whole country. What Rishi Sunak hasn't answered, or Oliver Dowd or anybody else, is why Lee Anderson had the wit removed, but Suella Braverman has not, when the comments she, she made were just as bad about the whole country. Just well, what did she the, say? The I'm, argument, not, I'm not up to date. She before. said that the, the Islamists and the extremists and the anti-Zionists were in control of the whole of the UK. I mean, clearly ludicrous comments from a woman desperate to self get herself back in the newspapers because she wants to be the next Conservative Party leader. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is all about people positioning to become the next Conservative Party leader. Possibly not Lee Anderson. Presumably he isn't deluded enough to think that he could be the next Conservative Party leader. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as um, as you were saying, he decided not to apologise and so has lost yeah. the whip. Rightly so. And, uh, and look, mm. so many Muslims deeply offended by what he said and you know, Baroness Varsi pointing out that actually anti-Muslim racism is being used as an electoral campaigning tool now, and that that's why she thinks the party's been dragged into the gutter. And she says sensible people are, are leaving the party. Has she got a point? Um, I don't think she has. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Saeed Varsi pops up every now and again, and will make, will make this case. But you know, look, you know, uh, Sajid Javid was the first one to sort of call out uh, uh, Lee Anderson for the comments that he made. I mean, let's sort of taking a step back. There is a sentiment shared by what Lee was trying to say. You know, there are cultural differences in this country. There are people who are uh, uh, going out onto the streets of London week after week. They are preaching hate. We see it in our society. We see it in communities. You take the Rochdale uh, uh, grooming gangs, for example. It is a particular culture. It's a particular group of people where I think local communities have felt for too long they haven't been able to call out things that go wrong because of cultural or religious differences or whatever. And I think that's the sentiment that Lee was trying to say. It's what Suella was trying to articulate. Um, but what Suella did... Uh, in comparison to what Lee did, is that, you know, Suella didn't say that the Mayor of London or any individual is in the pocket of or being led by uh, extremists or Islamic extremists, mm. which, which, which isn't correct. But there, is, there has to be what a do you conversation. Think the Mayor of London, 
Who do you mm. think is leading the mayor of London and what his agendas are and if he stands much of a chance of winning the next election? Well, well, well I don't think um, anybody's leading the mayor of London. In fact, the mayor of London just isn't leading. Um, and I think, look, you know, there isn't the housing in London, crime is up, you know, uh, he's slapped on this ULES charge for hard-working people that wanted to sort of go about their day-to-day. -day. Uh, you know, um, we're not seeing the progress that we need to in London. He has fundamentally failed. There are so many issues with this mayor of London. Um, but to suggest that he is, you know, being led by, uh, you know, extremist or Islamist in any way is, is just simply not right. There are lots of failings in the mayor of London. Mike, but here's but the thing, right. though. I worry that uh, a lot of people will latch on to this because it suits them. They want to hear this. They want to have a reason not to like Sadiq Khan. I mean, I will just say, I think Sadiq's done a, done a very good job in very difficult circumstances. Um, but you're right, there, there is an agenda. There has, since he became elected, there's been an agenda out there against him, in part because he is, he is a Muslim man. But I think he's done an incredible job, as I say, in very, very difficult circumstances. And it's the job of all politicians of any party to stand up against racism in all its forms. And separating out one from another doesn't do the country any good, and it certainly doesn't do any of these minorities any good either. Is, was the Prime Minister wrong not to call this Islamophobia? And this, uh, yes, he was. He was a coward. I mean, if a Jew had come out, if it had been anti-Jewish comment, um, would they have been treated in the same way if it had been anti-Semitic comments as opposed to Islamophobic? Well, I think actions speak louder than words, and the Prime Minister has acted, and the whip has been uh, But the whip's been withdrawn. removed because he didn't apologise, not because of what he said. If you apologise for being anti-Semitic, would you be able to stay within the Conservative Party? I suspect not. Well, I, I don't think, you know, if, if you're um, any kind of comment that's inappropriate or racist, you, you, you wouldn't be allowed. But I think what, what the, the apology that was asked of Lee was to probably uh, clarify his comments, because, as I say, you know, there is clearly, as you were just talking about in the WhatsApp groups with Red Wall MPs, with your viewers. You know, I've been here over the weekend and people have been emailing and texting in to say that they understand the sentiment of what Lee was trying to say. So it's not as if, you know, he's just come out of the, the woodwork and, 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 you know, and caused chaos unnecessarily so. There is a sentiment shared. We have to have, as a public, a conversation about cultural issues. We have to have a conversation about what's going on every weekend. Uh, the, you know, the, the hate uh, speech that is out on the streets of London, which Sue Ella has called out before. We have to have a conversation about that. But when you're having a conversation about it, especially if you're a politician, language is so important. And Lee didn't get the right language uh, uh, over the weekend, which is why the whip has been uh, withdrawn, because he failed to apologise. Yeah, Charlie, um, uh, hear, hear totally what you're saying. What I don't think is that neither you or Mike or are totally speaking on behalf of the great British public and um, throughout the country. And obviously, whether we all like it or not, Lee Anderson will have a following. There will be people who will believe what he's saying and they will echo what he's saying. And we want to hear from you this morning if you feel you are being represented, if uh, London-based television is uh, slightly lefty-leaning and uh, all cuddly like that or whatever. And, you know, if you live up north, if you're in Harrogate, if you're in Carlisle, uh, if you're in Rochdale, wherever you are today, and, uh, and if you're in Plymouth, wherever you are, um, is London speaking for you? Is the London media speaking for you? Um, or is um, Lee Anderson off his trolley? Let us, <laughs> let us know. Guys, thank you both yeah, thank very, you. very Mike, much Charlie, indeed. Uh, we'll speak to you again later. Thank you very much. At 6.11, let's take a look at some of the other stories coming into the newsroom this morning. And the long-serving Conservative MP Lord Cormac has died at the age of 84. He served as an MP from 1970 to 2010 and was elected 10 times, most recently for the constituency of South Staffordshire. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, described him as a vivid character who was unfailingly kind. A sombre milestone in Ukraine. President Zelensky has confirmed 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since Russia's invasion two years ago, giving the first official figure for more than a year. Speaking in Kyiv, Mr. Zelensky said he could not disclose the number wounded because it would help Russian military planning. And a new study from the Resolution Foundation has revealed young people are increasingly blaming mental health for joblessness. Over the decade, the number of 18 to 24 year olds who are economically inactive due to health issues has more than doubled, rising from 93,000 to 190,000. It's been described as a worrying trend, with 5% of young adults out of work as a result.
want to talk about supermarkets okay. now and who's doing uh, the best job out there. Uh, who do you use? Why do you use them? Well, uh, we have all uh, got a favourite one there somewhere or other, yes. And um, this year, for the third time in a row, M&S has been crowned the country's favourite. However, budget brand Aldi and Waitrose are coming for the crown in close second and thirds for uh, the supermarket title. Joining us now, business expert Zoe Whitman uh, on this one. Zoe, good morning to you. Quite an interesting thing, isn't it? You've got your, your budget, uh, your, your bargain supermarkets in second and third place, and yet M&S, still the country's favourite in first. Is it? It's an interesting one, and I wonder whether, you know, one of the reasons, one of the big stories that came out of this was that the it was very difficult to score five out of five for value this year. In fact, no supermarket was able to do that. And I do wonder whether the way we measure value is changing or it's something to consider between the different stores. You know, M&S are known very well for their value. They, they actually stand by a value equation that they use where they talk about value being price, but also quality. And when we're comparing Marks and Spencers to the budget supermarkets like Aldi and Lidl, we're actually comparing very different experiences. We're, ex we're comparing very different types of product, different ranges, different expectations around customer service as well. Fascinating, isn't it? When we've just all been going through and are continuing to live through a cost of living crisis, the people are, you know, when we all know how much more our supermarket shops are costing, but they're still prepared to go to the top range because, you know, Marks and Sparks is lovely, but it's a pretty penny. They need to speak to their audience, though, don't they? And, you know, some of the feedback from the, from the survey that which prepared was that it was sometimes a bit pricey. But then if you think about what you're comparing it to, if you're comparing something like Marks and Spencer's dine-in meal, you know, we've all gone and got that, haven't we? When there's a special occasion, dine-in for a tenner, um, you're not really comparing that to what those ingredients would cost you at a budget store. You're comparing them to the alternative of eating out in a restaurant. So, you know, the way we are using Marks and Spencer's in our everyday life is different to the way we use the budget supermarkets. Some of the respondents to the survey said that they would struggle to complete a weekly shop if Aldi wasn't out there. Um, but are the same people going to Marks and Spencers expecting to do their weekly food shop? I think we're looking at a different a different target market. Yeah. And um, how would you sum up the the Asda and Morrison's experience there? They were both at the bottom of the rankings with a score of 64 percent. Both scored just two stars for value for money, and they failed to achieve more than a mediocre score in any category. Um, mm -hmm. So how would you how would you sum them up? Because they're such a part, a big part of a lot of people's lives. Yeah, I think supermarkets are a real a habit, aren't they? You know, we are loyal to a store that we know and trust. It might be based on the location. It's just part of our everyday routine and making a change does take a bit of effort. Um, actually, interestingly, Marks and Spencer's only came out at two out of five on value. So, you know, I think it was really difficult. The, t the top scores were for Aldi and Lidl, who got four out of five this year. So no one was getting that top spot. And I think it just shows how difficult people are finding it to um, make their money spread when going to do yeah. the weekly food shop. You know, Zoe, just quickly, I mean, you talk about location. And when I think about it, virtually every petrol station that I cross or pass on my drive home has an M&S in or near it. And then I went into the hospital recently uh, near to my home and there was a Marks and Spencer's supermarket inside the hospital. So they seem to have done very well at acquiring lots of really key locations in the country, which is obviously making them very popular. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's demand has forced yeah. them into those places. But it's definitely a changing landscape when it comes to M&S. Do you think that when you go somewhere like a hospital or you're on a journey, you see it as a kind of special occasion and the way that you buy food Maybe. in that situation yeah. is different? Maybe it's a treat, a treat mm -hmm. supermarket. Um, Zoe, it would have been interesting to get your thoughts this morning. So just, experts, just before yeah. you go, just before you go, uh, when you run your, your eye down the list and the rankings of who finished where, and I'm thinking about the, the Waitroses, the Tesco's, the names we haven't mentioned so far today, what observation would you make in terms of who's really done 
not very well in, in all of this and who needs to take um, more attention into in what they are doing and what they are serving us with? Well, Asda and Morrisons came at the bottom of the survey. They both got 64% for their in-store experience. Now, um, some of the feedback was things like, I'm not getting everything I need uh, when I do my food shop. And you know, that's important when you are living by a budget and you need to make sure you can get everything. Um, you wanna get it done in one hit and not have to keep going to shop around. Um, there was also a survey of the online shopping experience and Aldi came at the bottom of that list, but they're not offering home delivery yet. Mm. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Zoe Whitman. Thank you. Zoe is a business expert. Mm. Now, after an incredibly wet Sunday where I live, I don't know about you, Eamon, and then incredibly windy this morning, uh, let's get an update on what's going to happen today with Jonathan Vautry. Hello there, there. Good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast though we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off but elsewhere a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea that is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll start pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up, turn lighter and patchier as we head throughout the day to the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we will turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. Thank you very much indeed. Paul Coit will have your latest sport. It's coming up. What have you got? I do. I reckon probably. 5%, 10% chance of England beating India, which is going on at the moment. Uh, Liverpool win the Carabao Cup. And also, the, oh, how about this? This is the f Italian rugby player who probably didn't sleep a wink last night. We'll talk about that shortly. The guy who hit the post. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Elon Musk has announced that the first patients to receive a groundbreaking brain implant <laughs> from Neuralink is recovering well. This is all a bit odd. Uh, the product, called Telepathy, uses a robot to surgically place a computer chip in a region of the brain that controls movement. Hmm. Yes, Elon Musk says that the first goal is to enable people to control a phone or a computer just by thinking. He says that initial tests show promising signs of brain activity, meaning that patients with paralysis could one, one day overcome their conditions. Hmm, not sure about this one. Joining us to discuss this breakthrough is applied futurist Tom Cheesewright. Tom, this sounds, uh, well, slightly terrifying. <laughs> I certainly think a lot of people will be thinking this is something out of a sci-fi horror rather than reality. But this is a technology that's been a long time coming. We've been developing direct brain computer interfaces for a long time, mostly for the sort of therapeutic reasons that are the initial goal, at least, of Elon Musk's Neuralink, to allow people who are perhaps quadriplegic to have direct control via their brains of initially a smartphone uh, and maybe ultimately artificial limbs or a wheelchair. It does seem fascinating how quickly this technology is moving on. I, I saw demonstrations perhaps a year or two ago of people playing a very simple Pong game just by thinking, moving sort of one uh, line on a screen up and down. This seems like potentially there has been a breakthrough that means far more complex things can be controlled just by thinking. Well, there's lots of different aspects to this technology. The initial attempts to interface with the brain use actually quite thick prongs almost that went into the brain and they were quite solid and so if the brain moved they could potentially cause damage.
time to go through the uh, the sports news with Paul now and um, the, the Carabao Cup final. I'm, I'm surprised it's still not going on. It went on and on and on. It, it really covered the weekend. And um, well, what did you make of it? I, I, I thought it was really entertaining. I mean, it was when, when you think it was nil nil. But I thought it was a really entertaining game. It kept me on the edge of my seat. And, and it was Gary Neville who's came up, who came up with probably the quote of the week, if not the month of the year, um, when it comes to football. I think it was the £1 billion uh, blue bottle jobs beaten by Klopp's kids. But the thing is, were did they bottle it? I think the whole point about Chelsea is that you've got a billion pounds worth of footballers who just didn't step up in, in extra time. And Liverpool... The injuries they got: Trent Alexander-Arnold, Mo Salah, yep, Darwin Nunes, yeah. Dominic Sabozlai, but Tom look, Toshak. that man there, that man there, yeah. he was the extra motivation, stimulation for them. Um, so here he is, his last season. Jürgen I think it was a big thing for them to make sure that he he leaves with something. And there's the first trophy. It could be four trophies. It won't be, but it could mm -hmm. be. Yeah. You won't see. The thing is about Jurgen Klopp. And whether you like him or you don't like it, I mean, I always have a go at Jurgen Klopp and thinking, you know, I don't like the way he argues back, I don't like the way he's in interviews, but what you cannot doubt is what a great manager he is. He's a winner. How do they he, replace yeah, him? A great totally story. a winner. How do they replace him? I mean, the, the, it, they were literally playing with kids. Jaden Dance is 18 years mm. old, James mm. McConnell, Bobby Clark came on, then 19. You've got Harvey Ellett, who's playing at start, and he's 20. And when you look at Liverpool and you think, oh, the amount of money that big clubs like that can spend, it was not a huge amount. If you look at the team that was out yesterday, I think it cost like one point, I don't know, sort of 10.6 million or something like that compared to what Chelsea have. It's absolutely no comparison. So yeah. um, it was a great result for Liverpool. Virgil van Dijk, I thought, was magnificent yesterday. He was the man of the match and scored the winner. Keevan Kelleher, or for those that are looking at the written version, Kayum Hin Kelleher yes. is Keevan, right? He was uh, in goal as well. OK. Very, very good performance and uh, congratulations. Right, to let's go to seven. Saturday. Let's go to uh, France against Italy, sitting on 13-13, all square. I mean, amazing to see Italy in that situation. What happens? Paolo, Paolo Garbisi. So Paolo steps up. This is in injury time now. And who would have thought, like you say, that, that Italy would stand a chance of beating France? They've only won one game ever in the Six Nations, and that was against Wales a couple of years ago, for 45 games. They're playing France, they're in Lille, and he steps up, he's got a penalty. All he's got to do is just put it in between the posts. Yeah, sure. Italy. I'm, I'm feeling nervous yeah. just talking about it. It's already happened, for crying out loud. So he steps up, puts it on the tee, and as he moves back the ball falls off the tee, which is very unusual. So then there's, a, there's the stop, stopwatch, which is just ticking away, and at 15 seconds then, puts it back on, steps back, hits it beautifully with his left foot, but it curls yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. Hits the, the Oh, yeah, my goodness me. Hits the post. I mean, it's an amazing result for Italy, but to have a chance to win it, yeah. can you imagine what he would be feeling? I mean, he would be in history for the rest of his life, as the the one that, that that beat France, but I don't know if he'll feel like he messed up. I think most people will look at that and think, how unlucky! Like, why did the ball just randomly fall over? So he messed up. No, it <laughs> did just it fell was... over before but he it's, kicked it. It's, yeah. it's, I don't know. I well, he, he had the chance to kick it. it pure again, yeah. and he yeah. messed it up. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. and it just. Moved I mean, over. listen, look, look oh. where that was sitting, I could have scored that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have, you know what, they could have just blown it over. But it was, it was just one of those things. Yeah, That's yeah. the pressure. That's what That's it's all the about, pressure. the final moment. If you can do it, it's not as easy as everybody seems. To OK, do something FA simple. Cup um, tonight. Talk us through uh, Coventry, Maidstone. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people looking at Maidstone and thinking, could they, could they? What do you think? Well, they could, because, let's face it, they beat Ipswich in the last round. They're in the sixth tier. They're in the sixth tier, the English League. I think we're looking at 90, 95 places between them and Coventry City, who they play tonight. Coventry, who won it in 1987, they've, they're a great story themselves, because they looked like they were going out of business, and then they fought back again. But as far as Maidstone are concerned, they're the first team from the sixth tier to reach... Um, you know, I'm full of facts today. Have you noticed yeah. that? First Always team... Full of facts. Yeah, I'm really full of facts today. First team from the fifth tier to reach... The sixth tier to reach the fifth round of the FA Cup since Blythe Spartans in 1978. 
So there's a great <coughs> chance they can beat Coventry. I don't think they will beat Coventry, but there's a great chance. Can you imagine if they move on to the sixth round? Mm. That, my friends, <laughs> is the magic of the FA Cup. That is. Um, that what's is happening terrible. in the cricket in India? Oh, England uh, limping on. <coughs> well, they are. I mean, it, it's it's slightly better. I mean, it's lunch now on the fourth day. Um, they had a really bad second innings, England, after the great start, and thinking, well, it's all over. Then India go into bat, and it all looks great for them. They need 74 runs now, India, and they've lost three wickets very quickly just before lunch. There is a very, very very slight chance. So if I was a betting man, have a few quid on maybe Maidstone to beat Coventry. Okay. Um, if it was going to be England possibly uh, beating India and both of those came in, I'd be a very rich man. I don't think there's much <laughs> chance, but you never know. There's if always were a, a chance. rich man. Is it Topol? Yeah. Yeah. I never get to never get Topol confused with Topov, who was the monkey in Pipkins. Do you remember Pipkins? Remember Pipkins? Oh. You don't remember Pipkins? He used to be on at lunchtime. Oh. Wait. <laughs> Johnny. I remember had... Top Gun. Top... It's so far away from Top Gun. You remember? <laughs> Johnny, who had like this shop and there were all these puppets and there was this pig that had a Birmingham accent and used to like strawberry ice cream. Oh, it's need... just me. You'll need a picture next time. Uh, need <laughs> I need that. a lay down, I think. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be looking at the day's top stories and front pages, making the news with Dawn and Chris Akabusi. Uh, next. Lee Anderson's Real World, Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, it was the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system. And So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for, for people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. OK, so we're in a pub, Jane, Dr Jane, uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the old tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down. But for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend, and I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So, speaking from my own experience, a good two-thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty, struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Right, thank you for your comments on Lee Anderson and a lot of you having your say today. Pauline says Lee Anderson speaks for all the Red Wall areas, such as Oldham, where I live. Robert says, don't like Lee Anderson for moving from them to the Tories. What does it mean, moving from them? Uh, and realise he speaks for so many people out there. I do find it hypocritical of Sadiq Khan and Labour for crying foul over his comments, yet they themselves throw out the term far right to label anyone that has an opposing view to them. Mm. Good point. Yeah, um, he was saying Labour don't like Lee Anderson for moving from them, because he used to be Labour, didn't he? And he actually worked for Gloria yeah. De Piero in her constituency. Now he's MP in that constituency. Keep your thoughts coming in. Obviously. Yeah, Lee Anderson's raising an issue the mainstream media and politicians are afraid to raise. Roger says, having told the public that a vote for reform is a vote for Labour, how can he now get on board with reform? Now, we've got so many um, uh, opinions here. He obviously... You see, here's my point. 
he's written off as mad, he's written off as racist and whatever, and the point is, he's obviously speaking for a lot of you, and that is being ignored. That annoys me, I have to say. It's being ignored. There's no examination into the fact, mm. could Merkan be racist? Could he be being, having his strings pulled elsewhere? We've got Don Neeson and we've got Chris Akabusi here, and they're talking about the stories they're making the news, of which uh, this is one of them. Don, what do you think? Oh, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? There, I think there are lots and lots of reasons to um, have a go at Sadiq Khan for the situation London's currently in. And knife crime, the ULES zones, 20 mile an hour zones, um, all sorts of reasons to have a go at Sadiq Khan. Um, I can completely understand the anger out there that um, Lee Anderson does talk for a lot of people, the silent majority, and, you know, you do hear that a lot. Um, however, I think the rhetoric involved here, I think it's all to do with the language. I understand the sentiment, I understand people are worried, and that's fair enough. It doesn't make you a racist to be worried about an issue. Um, but I think some of the language all our politicians use at the moment is dangerous. And we saw this weekend that MPs are having to have extra security because they feel there's a threat to them and their family's safety, and I think that's important. But they have to look at the language they're using and how they're behaving as well. And this isn't just a Conservative thing. Mm. This applies to pretty much all parties at yeah. the moment. But what do you think about this, Chris? Because the former Justice Secretary came out saying to conflate people and groups of people that are based on race or ethnicity with extremists is incredibly dangerous. And as far as he's concerned, it, it was racist. Yeah, well, I'll keep on the major side, but, yeah, it's definitely dangerous. And I think when you're in a position of responsibility, you've got the right to take care of how you actually articulate things because the... And it sounds like some of your viewers agree with Lee. Uh, there's free speech. But the upshot can be tensions on the street and then who's responsible. So I am, you know, I think people like Lee and the former Home Secretary, um, Sir Ella Brotherman, you've got to be very, very careful that people without your intellect may take it a different way. OK, let's have a look at the front pages of the, uh, the papers <coughs> on this Monday morning. And we begin with The Times. It leads with the former Secretary James Cleverley's artificial intelligence warning ahead of the upcoming election. Uh, as we've been reporting, The Telegraph uh, has top Tories warning of potential backlash over Lee Anderson's whip withdrawal. Daily Mail, Generation Sick Note. A report reveals young people are blaming mental health for taking time off work, and those sick figures have doubled to around 190,000. Uh, here's The Guardian, leading with pressure on the Prime Minister to address claims of Islamophobia within his party. The Express reports on potential annual migrant influxes of a quarter of a million if Labour wins the <coughs> upcoming election. <coughs> right, OK, so let's begin. Chris, uh, we're, we're talking about um, uh, mental health issues and um, youngsters being <coughs> off sick. Uh, it's been called Generation Sick Note. It is the front page of the Daily Mail. Yeah, yeah. So I've enjoyed actually reading this article. Um, before getting to that, I just want to say, on the page five of the same paper, yeah. uh, it says, get a 16-year-old at a private school kill himself after online blackmail over new photos. So I want to put this in context, that the young people of 16 and 24 a day are growing up in a context that you and I did not experience. Uh, uh, and so mental health issues can be a real thing, is a real <laughs> thing, and needs to be acknowledged as, as such. However... What the paper does go on to say about this scenario is that issues that we may have, may have dealt with when we were young, like when you leave, 16 and 24, you're leaving home. All of a sudden, you get faced with reality that you're not the, you know, you do paint outside the lines. No, that's not very good. That's rubbish. Sort it out. You, do, you get failure. You get alienation. And where we would have necessarily taken it on the chin and our age group, now people say, no, you're affecting my mental health. Because, we, you know, we, we, we speak so much about the mental health issue. So what I'm trying to say is I acknowledge mm. that, that the young mm. person lives in a completely different world mm. and does get bombarded by a plethora of stuff from a million people potentially on the internet as opposed to our 100 people that we met in our life. However, there are certain existential norms 
You're thrown into a world, you're in a family, and we have a way of doing things. And when you leave that family, the world tells you, not good enough. When you've been told, oh, you're a good little boy, and yeah, don't worry about that, yeah, you're fantastic. No, you're not fantastic. It's a big, bad world out there. It's a big, bad world, and people are hard. And I'm going for the same job as you are, and I'm better than you. And I say that to your face, mm. when before, you've been a little bit more modicoddled. So, I'm trying to be balanced recognising yeah. it's a tough world out there. We live in different zeitgeists. The irony is you talk about going for the same job, but there was a story doing the rounds yesterday oh, about yes. all these generation snowflakes not bothering to even turn up for interviews. And I think that feeds into this mentality, this concern that the young are lazy, that they don't necessarily want to be in the it was, It's this very generation, as wasn't it, Isabel, as well, 18 to 24-year-olds. <clears throat> I think it was something like that in the late 60s, possibly 70% of them, simply don't bother turning up for job interviews. I know. Don't bother turning <coughs> up. They don't even let the companies know. It's, it's basically ghosting them. And, the, you know, they said that they felt that companies didn't deserve them and they felt empowered by not bothering <coughs> to let uh, um, companies know they couldn't mm. turn up. But, yeah, but, I mean... Back in the day, I mean, I, I just got so nervous about job interviews. Not only would I turn up, I'd turn up an hour earlier mm. with yeah. loads of notes, because that's what I do, I make notes. Um, and the fact that they feel... I, can, I think Chris <coughs> made a brilliant point there about the mental health and that young lad taking yeah. his own life. But I, I, I think th there is a, a problem here that they are not taking responsibility. It's difficult to talk about with, with that one there as well, but there is a... They're not as responsible, I think, as older generations mm -hmm. could be. It's funny, you write a lot of notes, you definitely don't write sick notes, do you? No, I don't I'll write sick notes, no, I've never no, done that, never no. no but, I think, but, I think, you know, but I think also, you know, we have this influencer generation, so actually it appears to the young person sitting 24 that there's instant success out there when they see all these young stars... Looking... Yeah, the pressure is immense, isn't Exactly. It? Yeah, we can't underestimate that. Um, um, we move to the yeah. front page of The Times and uh, there's this... <clears> uh, <clears throat> Cleverly story, he warns of AI fakes as yeah. a threat to the next election. Yeah, this is quite fun. It's fright AI frightens a life out of me because, you know, I'm not Generation Sick now. I'm way older and I don't understand what's going on here. But James Cleverly, Home Secretary, is meeting with Silicon Valley bosses this week, warning that tech and social media is moving so fast now and AI is programming other AI, so we have no idea what's going on. And it's actually a danger to society, especially with so many important elections mm -hmm. coming up this year. And it's like, you know, if you think back to the 2020 um, US presidential election, that was decided in three swing states with fewer than 45,000 votes. Now, a bit of misinformation put out there on social media can yeah. swing that one way or the other. So I think James Cleverly is right to be pointing this out. And, and obviously, he's talking about the election issue and there's elections going on all around the world this year, incredibly important. But, you know, talking about other stuff, like Chris was alluding to that poor young man took his own life, it's affecting young people as well. You don't know what's true online. You don't know what to believe anymore. Mm. It's, it's scary. Yeah, and it spreads, it spreads beyond election situations, yes. doesn't it? You know, you could see yourself in a, in a murder trial, for yes. example, and evidence being presented to the court of a deep fake where yeah. you are seen holding said weapon yes. in said place and, of, I, and you know, I can't said tell the crime. difference. I mean, I was one of those people, you know, the Pope in a puffer jacket. Yeah. I was taken oh, by that. Unbelievably good. Yeah, That's... no, it's, it's really worrying. But how on earth you put the genie back in the bottle, I don't really know. <sighs> Um, Chris, let's talk about Mail Page 3, Go Fly a Kite. Yeah. The Mary Poppin hit uh, oh. with PG label over racism rules. Yeah, so I, I, I remember this film so much as a kid. It was one of the classics. Yeah. Let's go, go and fly a kite up, up to the <laughs> highest height. You know, I mean, there are so many classics. And I didn't realise there was anything racist about it at all. Even yeah. the words... Well, well, for example, apparently... And this is showing my ignorance. Hot and tot. Now... I've, I've read books, you know, South African books about hot and tots, uh, uh, and apparently it's, it's a defamatory term. And, and I didn't really know. It's, it's supposed to be racially offensive. And um, I think it's really, really kept because, because um, Mary Poppins, since before it came out, I remember it coming out first time round, and it's depicted in the 20th century. Uh, and as a young kid, I was just, it was just magical watching over a brolly oh, yeah. and all the sweets and, 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 and the darts in. And it was just, it was just magical. And so what the, um, the BBFC, uh, uh, the British Board of Film Classification said, we've got to reclassify, reclassify as parent guidance because it might potentially scar young people. Well, 
the only school I've had is was great fun. It was, you, uh, yeah, we don't uh, stick kids up chimneys anymore either, and that's a great part of that film. I mean, does that need a warning on no, that yeah, bit as well? Yeah, yeah. Mean, all the class references as well. Have oh. you? You've got all the female, the voting suffrage. It's women, yes. That. So where do you stop? Yeah, it gets a bit. It's crazy. ridiculous. Just enjoy it for what it is, yeah. the time it was set in, and enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> On that optimistic note... <laughs> um, yeah. Should we talk about HS2, um, Chris? I'm sorry, I keep choosing your story. Yeah, no, that's OK. Anyone you want to sneak in with one quickly. Well, let's talk about Donald Trump and then we'll come back to that. Yeah, we've got okay. the transport sector on in a moment. Donald Trump's warned that Prince Harry will be on his own if he's re-elected as president and has criticised the Duke of Sussex for betraying... The Queen. Which, uh, you know, after the results at the weekend where he beat his newest uh, um, uh, competitor, Nikki Haley, in a home state of South Carolina, well, anything's possible. But, um, yeah, uh, um, unlike Biden, who said that, you know, Harry is welcome despite confessing to taking drugs in his autobiography, Spare, or biography, or whatever, memoirs, wasn't it, memoirs? Um, you know, that's fine, cos if you've, if you've got a history of drug-taking, you're not allowed in America, you won't get a visa. Biden seems fine with that. Trump, on the other hand, has come out and said, if I win, and that is a potential, um, Harry is not going to get any favours cos he disrespected the Queen. And no matter what you think of Trump, I quite like that attitude, to be honest with you. But, yeah, so, I mean, he could, in theory, refuse Harry a visa in America and we could have him back here. Do we really think that would happen? No, no I don't think it would happen, but it's a fun story. It like there could be, have been some special treatment with this visa and, and it sounds like <clears> the <throat> judge has just asked to see a copy of it and it could become public and we might all see exactly wh whether he lied. On, on his well, this is the stupid thing about the case that's going on at the moment. I mean, Harry's own lawyer said, OK, yeah, he admitted in his memoir spare to taking drugs, I think it's cannabis and magic mushrooms and things like that. Doesn't mean it's necessarily true. And it might not... have just been to promote book sales. Mm, I wonder. <laughs> Good defence, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean look, look, I mean, we, we, we hammer this guy... Um, we say to him, oh, keep up the limelight, stop talking, and yet we continue talking. And here, one of the most powerful men in the world, Mr Trump, thinks that, actually, if I mention this, this might give me a little bit of street cred. Just leave the guy alone, OK? You know, if he wants to be out of the limelight, let him be out of the limelight and leave him alone. I'm sick and tired of talking about Harry and Meghan. You know, they're over in Montecito doing their gig, and it's their gig and it's their life. You know, that book came out what, two years ago, wasn't it? Was it two years ago? Was it eight months ago? Maybe even a year ago. No, I think it was about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, a year yeah, ago? Yeah, I mean, look, if you want to keep on kicking the guy, well, keep on kicking the guy, but there's, there's big things going on, cost of living and all that sort of stuff. This one, mm. it's, it's a non-story for me. The, the thing is, I mean, Donald Trump's a master publicist, isn't he? I mean, yeah. he knows exactly the right thing to say to get us talking, not about Harry so much, but about Trump, and that's exactly what we're mm. doing. Right, Chris, let's talk. We've got Mark Harper, who's the Transport Secretary. Uh, he's going to come on very shortly. Yeah. Um, and he's going to announce what he's doing with £4.7 billion of reallocated HS2 funding. What do you make of what they've got planned? Uh, yeah, right, OK. So, I think that nice idea. So, the northern towns that are not going to have this super highway come, a uh, uh, railway come to them, are going to get this £4.7 billion pounds better cost to them. But if you go further into the detail, it's not going to be available to 2025 yeah. when, when this government <laughs> potentially won't be there to have to deliver on that promise. But, uh, but what you can see is that this government's trying to say, we're still sticking to the levelling up agenda. You know, we're still true to our word. Um, um, but it might be Sir Kia who's got to deli deliver it. So it's just a it's just, it's, it's spin for me. It's, it's just spin for me. So we're doing something, but we have, but we're not going to have to spend the money necessarily, or certainly not this government, Richard Sunak's government, in this dispensation is not going to have to deliver it. So yeah, it, it's nice, it's fluffy, lo lovely bit of electioneering, but not my problem, Gov. It's also quite shocking when I was reading um, the, the actual link between London and Birmingham, the HS2 bit that is going ahead, isn't going to open, I don't think, until possibly as late as something like 2033. I, well, that exactly that, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm sure... I mean, Rome was pretty much built in a day, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> I, I, HS2 is taking longer than I think I'm going to live, and I feel like I've been talking about <laughs> yeah, it same. since, like, God was a boy. Um, it, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I just, just do not understand how it can take so long costs so much money and we're still debating whether it's right or wrong or where it's going. It's 
just do something for once. OK, well, what we're going to do is uh, link now to Mark Harker, who is the uh, the Transport Secretary, and uh, he joins us now from uh, the Siemens factory in Gull. Uh, we say good morning to him. Good morning. Uh, Transport Secretary, where is Gull? Forgive me. Good morning, Eamon. Sorry, say that again. Where is Gull? Forgive me, I don't know. It's, it's in East Riding of Yorkshire, and the reason why we're here is this is one of the parts of the world that's going to be getting a significant amount of money in our local transport fund announcement today. The East Riding is going to be getting £168 million of money to spend over the next seven years on its priorities on local transport, so that's why we're here. Right. What are you going to do with that money? Well, it's not what I'm going to do with it. We're announcing £4.7 billion for the North and the Midlands, £2.5 billion for the North, £2.2 billion for the Midlands. That money is going to local councils. It's for them to spend on the local priorities that they set, that they think are important to their local communities, and they'll reach those conclusions by consulting those communities, but also talking very importantly to their members of parliament about what those important local transport priorities are. The whole point is it's not for ministers to set those priorities, it's for councils to set them. We think those decisions are better made closer to the people that are going to benefit from them. The party calling this a back of a fag packet plan and another example of broken promises. I mean, they've got a point, haven't they? Uh, to quote the Shadow Transport Secretary, she says, only the Conservatives have the brass neck to promise yet another transformation of transport infrastructure in the Midlands and the North after 14 years of countless broken promises to do just that. Well, not in the slightest. This is only possible, this money. Transformational spending, actually, is only possible because of the decision the Prime Minister took last year to cancel the second phase of HS2, stop spending a third of the country's transport budget on a single rail line, and instead spend a significant amount of money, £4.7 billion, in the North and the Midlands on local transport priorities for councils to spend uh, over the next seven years on the things that their communities think are important. So new roads, new road junctions, refurbished bus and rail stations, new electric vehicle charging points, anything that they think is important to improve the local journeys that people take every day of the week. That's a very clear commitment. It's a commitment we made last year, and we're now today setting out the detail of the money that will be available to local council. And I think most local councils will find that very exciting prospect. They've never had this sort of money before to spend on local transport priorities, ever. And that, that could be potholes, for instance, could it? Yes, it could. We've, as you know, uh, Eamon, because I've been on your programme setting out before, we set out last year £8.3 billion across the whole of the country for councils to spend on improving local road maintenance. That was also from HS2 savings. Local authorities could use some of this to improve those local roads further, or they could use it for other transport priorities. But the brilliant thing is it'll be up to them and local people to decide what those priorities are, not somebody telling them in white We've previously had money available for those big city regions and those elected mayors, people like Andy Street and Ben Houchen. This is the money that's now going, equivalent money, going to smaller cities and towns and rural areas across the North and the Midlands to enable them to take the same transformative uh, transport decisions. That's what you get if you get a Conservative government. Can we talk about Lee Anderson and the comments that he has made? Um, Oliver Dowden yesterday struggling to use the words Islamophobic. Do you think that his language was Islamophobic? And if not, what did you want, indeed, the party want him to apologise for? And why was the whip removed? Well, look, I think what Lee Anderson said about the Mayor of London was wrong. And the reason, and he was given the chance to retract those comments and to apologise for making them. He didn't do so, and that's why the whip was removed very swiftly, and I think that was the right decision. There are many things to criticise Sadiq Khan for. He's got a terrible record as Mayor of London. I've been very critical about his rolling out the ULES scheme with a false prospectus about why he's doing it, to do with air quality, when the evidence says it's nothing to do with it, pricing poorer motorists off the road. That's what we should be attacking Sadiq Khan about, his record, not about saying things that aren't correct and are wrong 
and that's why Lee Anderson had the whip removed. Yes, but to be clear, why were they wrong? I mean, it, the former Justice Secretary, for example, says they were repugnant and racist and said that it's wrong to conflate whole groups of people that are based on race or ethnicity with extremists. And Baroness Farsi, the first Muslim member of the Conservative Party ca um, cabinet, she said that the Conservative Party has been led into the gutter and this, that, that anti-Muslim racism is being used as an electoral campaign tool. So I ask you again, do you think that the language that he used was Islamophobic? Look, no, I've been very clear. What he said was wrong. In my book, wrong is actually quite a strong word. It was wrong for him to say it. He was given the opportunity to retract those comments and to apologise. He didn't do so. That's why the Prime Minister and the Chief Whip took very swift action to remove the whip from him. And I think that was the right thing to do. Um, and I hope Mr Anderson will reflect on those, uh, those actions uh, and will reconsider uh, apologising. You know, as I said, Sadiq Khan has a very poor track record in London. I think it's very important that we beat him and we get Susan Hall elected. We do that by focusing on his record and pointing out why that's wrong. We shouldn't be saying things about him that are wrong and are not true. Uh, there's plenty in his, own, his record that we can beat him on and I'm going to focus on his failures on transport uh, and the failure to get London moving, his blanket 20 mile an hour policies, his expansion of ULEs, his taxing of motorists, his secret plans for a network of charging cameras across London. Those are the things I'm going to campaign against Sadiq Khan on. Yeah. Um, and that's what Lee Anderson should be doing, not saying things that well, are wrong. Mark, I have to say to you, a lot of people just feel there's, there's one narrative coming out of Westminster and the London-based media, and they, they don't agree with you. Bob says, many of us moan about politicians avoiding issues and not telling us the truth. <coughs> then when a politician says exactly what he thinks inside the Commons, he gets lambasted and sacked. His claims should have been discussed rather than silenced. Maybe the other politicians are scared or have their head in the sand. And a lot of people, Mark, um, saying that reform, the Reform Party, will get their vote as a result of all of this. James says the M25 bubble doesn't speak for the rest of the country. It's madness to think it does. Uh, Robert says, I think Lee Anderson's comments regarding Sadiq Khan are spot on and they need to be investigated. So. Um, where do we go from here, my friend? Well, look, there are two different things there. Look, what Lee Anderson said about Sadiq Khan uh, was wrong, and the, we've been very clear about that. But there are people with perfectly legitimate concerns um, about what happened last week, and the Prime Minister himself has said it's quite wrong the, the threat of violence against MPs and the sort of uh, mob behaviour we saw that was allowed to change the procedures in the House of Commons. And, you know, Keir Starmer has questions to answer about why he put the Speaker under such pressure to change the rules in Parliament to reflect threats to MPs. We should never change what we do in Parliament because of threats to member of, members of Parliament. And we work very closely, the authorities, with the police to protect members of parliament so that they can say in parliament what they want without fear or favour. But we do also have a responsibility as members of parliament to make sure we say things that are accurate. And as I said, what Lee Anderson said about Sadiq Khan was wrong and he shouldn't have said it. OK, Mark Harper, we've got to leave it there. Thank you for your announcement today on the programme. Good luck. Thanks, Eamon. Thanks. Not Thank at all. You. The transport budget there. Uh, your views, you've heard what Mark Harper's had to say. Let us know what you think. Good morning to Jonathan with the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, there, good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast though we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off but elsewhere a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea that is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll start pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. 
a fine end to the day for many of us as well. Some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off. So certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland. So we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland. But the band will tend to break up to lighter and patchier as we head throughout the day. So the far southeast staying dry for most. And we'll turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well. So do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Lots of people have different ideas, mm -hmm. but principally a conservative approach to getting growth is to reduce taxes so that people, ordinary people and businesses can spend more of their own money to invest and grow the economy. So the theory is that you cut taxes and that then pumps more money exactly right. into the economy. Exactly the right. Growth. And then people, you know, it's not government that are creating wealth. It's individuals, businessmen, companies that create wealth. It's the private sector that creates wealth, that the public sector then taxes and, and, and spends. I get the theory, but one of the criticisms of you, sure. and I think one of the criticisms actually of all political parties, is they appear to be incapable of cutting government spending. That's the key. I mean, and I think when I look back, is that we should have had a, a, a credible plan to reduce the increase in spending. Mm. Now, that's often a difficult concept to explain. But it's in line with inflation, etc. That's all right. So, yeah. so when, you, when, you, when you're slowing the increase, it means, you know, one year you spend £100 and the next year you spend maybe £101 as opposed to going up to £110. So the, the, the actual level isn't going down, but you're slowing the increase. And that's very much what mm. I tried to do. And actually, looking back, the one thing I wish we'd done, I'd done, was to present a credible spending uh, plan at the same time as the tax cuts that we that we announced. You had a go. It didn't work out for whatever reason. For, yeah. and, 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 and that analysis will go on for some for a while, years yes. to come. We have Jeremy Hunt uh, there as Chancellor now, hinting quite strongly now there won't be any tax cuts. But the truth of it is, under 14 years of Conservatives, for a variety of reasons, the tax burden has risen. That's right. To the highest since the Attlee government way back yeah, in 80 years, 1951, years, yeah, whatever right. it is. Good morning. It's about to turn 7 o'clock. It is Monday, the 26th of February. Whatever you're doing, I hope your day's going well. If you're starting with us, it's Eamon and Isabel. Breakfast here on GB News. Divisions within the Conservative Party deepen as the Prime Minister faces a red wall backlash over Lee Anderson's sacking. However, one former party chairman hits out, arguing the Conservatives have been dragged into the gutter. Leveling up in action or another broken promise? The government's announcing a £4.7 billion local transport fund for the North and the Midlands. Critical juncture for Israel. Ceasefire talks taking place in Paris as the Prime Minister Netanyahu doubles down on a possible Rafa assault. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll be joined by the Israeli political, the politician and diplomat Ambassador Danny Dannon. 7.20, we'll be talking about Angela Rayner after she was forced to defend herself over selling her council house for a profit. We'll be debating the future of the controversial right to buy scheme. And sport this morning, could the miracle happen? England now need just five wickets to beat India, whilst India needs 70 runs. Chelsea lose their sixth domestic cup final in a row to Jurgen Klopp's kids. And the magic of the FA Cup is back with lowly Maidstone taking on Coventry in the fifth round tonight. It's a fine start to the week for many of us with some sunny spells on offer, but how long will it last for? Join me later to find out all the details. It's 
701. Our top story this morning, the row over claims of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party is deepening again today. According to the Daily Telegraph newspaper, leaked WhatsApp messages from some Conservative MPs have raised concerns over Mr Anderson's suspension. Those MPs fear that they could see a revolt from voters who will now move to the Reform Party after what they say they've been flooded with supportive messages about Lee Anderson. However, Baroness Saeed Warsi, a former party chairwoman and first Muslim cabinet member, now peer in the House of Lords, has accused the Conservatives of being dragged into the gutter as she criticises the party's response. Well, joining us this morning is former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley. Good morning again to you, Charlie. Morning. What a mess. Mm. Another day, another mm. row within the Conservative Party. And to be perfectly honest, more votes being handed to reform, which probably means the keys to Labour. That's absolutely right. Um, and that will be the message that the Conservative Party will obviously want to take to the country to say if you vote uh, reform, that just lets Starmer in through the back door. You don't get the policies, the Conservative policies, that the government actually needs to be articulating and delivering on. And stories like this, uh, where their front page, uh, where it takes up all uh, front pages of uh, today's newspapers, is just another day when the Conservative government isn't getting out its message. Um, I mean, you've had the brilliant uh, Transport Secretary Mark Harper uh, in Brigham Gould uh, today setting out what money is going into uh, local rail infrastructure, where that money would have gone to HS2. That is not something that the public will be talking about by the end of the day. But they're talking about the Lee Anderson. Yes. Tell me what yeah. you think about Lee Anderson. Uh, I'm not talking about specifically this. This issue mm. is he a force to be reckoned with? Does he know that? Is that why he allowed himself to be kicked out? Well, I mean, Lee's got a, a, a great history. He left the Labour Party to come to the Conservative yeah. Party, like many voters did in 2019, and because Labour had left uh, people like Lee behind. Labour had left those communities in the north, particularly in, uh, in the north, in the northwest, uh, northeast rather, yeah. um, uh, behind for far too long. So um, Lee is very popular. He says it how it is. Um, we need politicians like that. You know, you don't just need people. Why is he not be popular after... then with this view? Well, he's um, uh, he, well, he's obviously quite popular in the, in the WhatsApp groups and some of the. Uh, yeah, there's a lot really of people here giving him a lot of and, support this morning. And I think because you know we've got to have a conversation about some of these issues. You know, you know, it, it's not racist to talk about immigration. That's an age-old saying. But you know, when there are community was, tensions, was we need to. Was he talking about immigration, or was he alleging that the mayor of London? was basically being puppeted by Islamic extremists. And, and, and that's why I think it was wrong for him to say what he said, but the sentiment of allowing uh, 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 fundamentalism or extremism to be uh, preached on the, the streets of London, which it is being um, and has been, and the Metropolitan Police seem uh, absolutely hopeless or unable to deal with that. He is the mayor of London. He has to take responsibility for, for, for mm. that. Um, and, you know, for all of his failings that we've all talked about, you know, um, uh, I think the wording and the language that Lee used on this particular occasion uh, was wrong but he says it how it is and so whether it's true or not um, let's leave that aside will he have struck a blow against Sadiq Khan will he have um, he won't have helped surely Sadiq Khan uh, mayoracy uh, election well, I mean, I think uh, people need to look at uh, Sadiq Khan's record, you know, and we're not, he's not built the homes that London needs. Crime is up, the transport infrastructure network, you've only got to get a, try and get a tube or a bus and you have to wait, uh, uh, it seems to me, um, uh, many, many minutes more than what you used to. Uh, and, you know, there's uh, you less charges and you know, penalties slapped on hard-working motorists. That's not something that I think Londoners want. That is a terrible record for a mayor of London. Mm. Um, but I think... Uh, these comments will um, only have maybe helped Sadiq in, to an extent um, because people are sort of feeling sorry for him in, in one regard yeah. um, when I really don't think people so, should. So finally, where does this leave Lee Anderson? What's next for him? Um, well, look, I think he will um, uh, continue to... Um, be supportive of the government. He said that he would. That was his statement he put out last night. And I think in due course, um, he, he may have the whip returned. Um, uh, and um, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Got to leave it there, my friend. Charlie, thank thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. The time now, five past seven. Israel could be close to agreeing a ceasefire in Gaza after mediators in Paris spent days wrangling over the release of remaining hostages held by Hamas. It comes after demonstrations in the Israeli city of Tel Aviv called for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's resignation over the weekend. We're now joined by Member of Israel's Parliament and former Israeli Ambassador to the UN, that's Ambassador Danny Dannon. Uh, very good to see you, Ambassador. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Um, to people who would say, who look at the whole situation in Gaza, and they say, 
October the 7th, awful, it had to be revenged. We get that, we go that far with you, but you've done enough. Now stop. What would you say? It's not about revenge. It's about our future, about our security. We are determined to do whatever is necessary to prevent another October 7th. And as long as Hamas is in power in Gaza, mm -hmm. we cannot sleep that night and, and wait for the next attack. So it's not about revenge. It's about making sure we can live safely in Israel. And before October 7th, we had a ceasefire. I want to remind everybody, we left Gaza in 2005, and look what happened. So <clears throat> we don't want to be in Gaza. We have no intention to stay there for the long term, but we are determined to eliminate Hamas, to release the hostages. Let's not forget, 134 people, including babies, are in the captivity of Hamas for almost five months. We don't know what the situation, we haven't seen footage, mm. so we are I know, and, determined and, and about it. And it's awful, and it's awful. Your babies against their babies. I, I was with a lot of Jewish friends at the weekend, and they were saying, awful, October 7, awful, something had to be done. And here's the mood that came across then. But they feel, but enough has been done. We've got to go easier now. We've got to change tact. Now, I'm sure you can understand why people think of that think like that, what would you say to them? Well, it's not easy. It's not easy for the people of Gaza. It's not easy for us. You know, we, we sacrificed a lot after October 7th. We, you know, we mobilized hundreds of thousands of people uh, into the military. We have evacuees, hundreds of thousand people who left their homes in the north and in the south. So we also want to move on, but we cannot move on. We, we have to eliminate the threat. Th that's crucial for us. We cannot finish uh, the job and allow Hamas to stay in power. So we have accomplished a lot, but we still have to go and, and make sure that we have a regime change in Gaza. And that's for the future, not only of the Israelis, but also for the people in Gaza. They deserve a better future. If you leave them with Hamas now, it's only a matter of time until we will see more of the same. Uh, Ambassador, you'll have heard and seen, you know, huge heated debate here in this country about, you know, what politicians think should be happening uh, in Gaza, whether there should be a ceasefire, you know, the SNP, for example, calling it collective punishment of civilians in, in Gaza, which is controversial, of course. We've also seen the debates in the United Nations. There is a public discourse now. The mood seems to be shifting, and I wonder if that's the same within Israel. We've seen these demonstrations taking place over the weekend, people calling for Netanyahu whose resignation, even families of the hostage members saying, actually, we, we don't want you to be obsessed with eliminating Hamas. We want to find a diplomatic resolution to this and we want the hostages out. Is Netanyahu on borrowed time? No, I think we actually we see unity in Israel. You know, last week we had a vote in the Knesset. 99 out of 120 MK, MPs voted in, in support of the position uh, of the government. And that was very rare, the numbers. Uh, and I think the unity is about the goals of the war, to bring back the hostages and to eliminate Hamas. And, and yes, we see the demonstrations of the families. I meet the families all day long. And we have no answers. You know, the only answer is to bring their loved ones b back to Israel. So now we are conducting negotiations. We don't know what will be the outcome of the negotiations. But, you know, what can you tell to a mother that her daughter, she's in captivity of Hamas? Mm -hmm. And we know that they are, uh, every day they are suffering from uh, sexual harassment. And we have testimonials about what's happening, mm -hmm. ongoing atrocities mm -hmm. in the tunnels of Hamas. There is no answers to that. So the people of Israel are, are strong, united, and they demand from the government to finish the job. You nothing nothing less than that. But you say they're united, but for the first time since the October 7 attacks, the police in Israel had to charge protesters on horseback and they had to use water cannon over the weekend. That doesn't sound like a united country. Well, we are, we are a strong democracy. You know, with freedom to demonstrate, uh, people are... are taking advantage of that, it's legitimate. But uh, at the end of the day, when you read the polls, the people demand from the prime minister to finish the job. You know, you can, we can argue about politics and we have a unity government t uh, today. You know, it reminds me of what happened here in the UK during World War II. You know, you left politics aside. You had a unity government. Mm -hmm. That's the same situation in Israel today. We don't deal with politics. We don't deal with legislation. We are focused on, on eliminating Hamas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the international community should allow us to finish the job. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, uh, we will be here again uh, yeah. discussing another war in Gaza. OK, how do we finish that job? There's so much I want to ask. I want to ask you about mm -hmm. uh, security, um, anti-Semitic uh, attacks in, in the UK, for instance, as well. 
But but let, let's go to Gaza again. How do you see this ending? Does this end with a one-state solution, a two-state solution? Um, what happens? Now, I presume you're going, you're, you're going to win this. You're going to win this situation, and you will eventually do down uh, Hamas and, and the PLO and everything to, to do with it. What happens then? First, we, we will win. We have no choice. There's no alternative for us. Mm. And after that, we will leave Gaza. We have no intention to you stay will leave, in Gaza. We, and we will you will leave. leave it under the jurisdiction of? That, that's the challenge, the day after. You know, I, I think we should allow a regional leadership to grow up in Gaza, which is not Hamas. And it's difficult, because for the last 18 years, Hamas took over everything in Gaza. They controlled Gaza. So now, very similar to what happened in Nazi Germany and in Japan after World War II, the denatification of the ideas, that would be the challenge not only for Israel, but for the democracies of the world, country that wants to support the people of Gaza, to allow new leadership to grow up and to wander life peacefully. And how hopeful are you after what we've seen over the weekend in Paris with these talks, uh, hopefully uh, a ceasefire and release of hostages? Are we getting closer to a deal, do you think? And I know that the Israelis are sending a delegation to Qatar later on this week to continue those discussions. Are we closer than ever, do you think? Well, I cannot go into details, but it's very complicated because, first, you know, we are negotiating the release of a few dozens. It means we're going to leave behind you know, dozens of people. And who knows when will be the next uh, opportunity to release them back. And second, the price. You know, it's a very heavy price. The release of terrorists who were convicted, people who, who committed the massacres in Israel, to release them back into Gaza. Uh, it's not easy for us. The prime minister instructed the team to continue with the negotiations. And we will have to wait to see what's happening in the next few days. Mm. Um, I've been looking into a story about um, violence against Jewish people in the UK, and it's up fourfold, fourfold on last year, and it's it's quite amazing that it is there. But it is it seems to be the perception that there is on these people because of what is happening um, there. What, what would you say? And, and I know there's a big security uh, conference this week, and uh, there is money being raised to to protect Jewish people and whatever. And um, what would you say to, to Jewish people who are watching us this morning and in genuine fear, whether they live in Manchester or London, for instance? By the way, it's unacceptable. And, and I expect from the government here in the UK to take the proper steps. It's the responsibility of the governments to ensure the safety of Jews all around the world. And what we see in the last few weeks is the rise of anti-Semitism. And, and I was shocked, you know, to see the demonstrations in London and New York even before we entered Gaza. On October 8th, October 9th, we saw uh, attacks against Jews in, in different countries. And it showed you that that pure anti-Semitism. We haven't got in, into Gaza by, at that time. And I expect the government to take real steps against those people who, who attack Jews, and not uh, only those who attack them physically, also verbally. That's what should happen now. Absolutely, and everybody would agree in condemning that. Just lastly, I want to ask you about the Rafa assault that's being planned. Um, Western governments, United Nations, urging Israel to think again about this. Is it going to go ahead? And, and how do you justify uh, an area being targeted that is housing over a million, predominantly women and children, but civilian people who've been told that that was the only safe place to go? I think we should have done it way back. And I expressed my opinion in different committees that I sit. Uh, and I think we cannot leave uh, Rafa intact. So we will have to allow the population to move to another area, like we did in northern Gaza. Uh, and then we're going to have to attack the Hamas battalions while there. Otherwise, it will be a safe haven for the Hamas terrorists that uh, fled to Rafa and, and they are finding shelter among civilians. So it will be a process. The first stage will be to allow the population to move out of Rafa to different areas. And then we're going to have to fight the or Hamas battalions and defeat them. They have no other choice. Okay. Your friends in the world, the people who are supporting you, the people who are neutral, then there are people, there are countries, there are states like Iran. What would you say about Iran and how big a danger is it to this whole situation and the instability there from a state like Iran? I think Iran is a threat only, not only to Israel, to so the people here in the, in the UK, because look what they are doing. They're promoting instability. 
the funding terrorists. You know, the drones that attack uh, our communities, they attack uh, the troops in Ukraine, they will attack Europe. Uh, it's only a matter of time. They, they pro provide the funds, the technology for terrorists. And yes, we are in the front line, so we suffer first. But it's the same what happened with the vessels uh, in Yemen. They attacked Israeli vessels. Today, they are attacking the UK, the US. So it's, it's a global threat, and no one can hide it. I know today people don't speak a lot about Iran because of what's happening in Gaza and Ukraine, but, but the world will have to deal with Iran. Ambassador, final word. If there's someone, and there are, there are going to be a lot of people who are very pro uh, what, what, Palestinian argument and all of this, they're very pro Hamas. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying that, that, that in, a, in a violent way, but that is where their sympathies lie with these people um, who, who are in Rafa and um, uh, generally uh, there. What would you say to those people? Is there any conciliatory hand that you can offer them, uh, and you can say this is coming to an end, or this is what has to happen before we can indulge in talks? So first, we are a peaceful nation, and we proved it. We signed peace treaties with Egypt, with Jordan, with uh, the UAE, with Bahrain, hopefully with Jordan, and hopefully with more, with more countries that will join us. Uh, uh, but if you actually care about the Palestinian, you shouldn't support Hamas. Look what they did in Gaza. You know, look at the amount of tunnels, uh, at the infrastructure of terror. They took advantage of, of the money that they, you gave to the people uh, in Gaza in order to build rockets. So if you really care about the future of the Palestinians, you cannot support Hamas at the same time. You have to think about the day after, who will be there, and how, how you can reconstruct Gaza. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Dan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your time this thank morning. you. Thank you. All right, the time is 18 minutes past seven. Let's take a look at the other stories making the headlines this morning. Long-serving long Conservative MP Lord Cormac has died at the age of 84. Um, he was elected 10 times, and um, most recently, for um, the constituency of South Staffordshire. The Archbishop of Canterbury described him as a vivid character who was unfailingly kind. It's a somber milestone in Ukraine. President Zelensky has confirmed 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since Russia's full-scale invasion two years ago, giving the first official figure for more than a year. Speaking in Kyiv, Mr Zelensky said he could not disclose the number of wounded because it would help Russian military planning. A new study from the Resolution Foundation has revealed young people are increasingly blaming mental health for joblessness. Over 10 years, the number of 18 to 24-year-olds who are economically inactive due to health issues has more than doubled. It's gone up from 93,000 to 190,000 and has been described as a worrying trend with 5% of young adults out of work due to sickness. It was blowing a holy for me first thing this morning. Let's get a look at what the weather's up to, where you are, with Jonathan Vautry. Hello there. After a good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us, and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast, though, we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing, so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent, and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off. But elsewhere, a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea. That is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll stop pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals. Underneath that, temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up, turn lighter and patchier we head throughout the day to so the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we will turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. Now stay with us. We're going to be discussing right to buy. Angela Rayner, a long time critic of the Margaret Thatcher policy, but she profited 
huge amount from selling her own council house. Is she a hypocrite or is it time to ditch the policy altogether? We'll be debating that next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Can do you find the union flag, the union jack divisive? Um, in some situation, but as Simon quite clearly states, and I agree with everything that he says in, in regards that there's situation when people use it for ulterior motive to cause fear, alarm and distress. We saw that with the far right when they came up to say protecting the Churchill statues and things of that nature. But largely on the large whole, even I wave the St. George's flag on a sport, sporting occasion. And I don't see anything wrong in, in raising the Union Jack or the St. George's flag mm. on, so long as the, the, the intention is, is correct. And as he says, Mr. Brockhurst, he served for the country and he should have every right to be proud of what he's done and the way that he wants to display it. All right, Simon, what do you make of this kind of, I would argue it as, like, student social media-based politics, where you get these pillocks from the Green Party who are saying, oh, it's divisive and I can't believe it. It will be legal in this country to do... Do, do those people need to get out more? I was on the streets of Stratford earlier on, an incredibly diverse place, speaking to a massive range of people right across different age demographics. I couldn't find a single sausage who said to me that they thought that this guy from the Green Party was right. He obviously has absolutely no attention from anybody. And this is his way of finding attention. Both Ken and I, myself, we both agree that nobody should use any symbol of national identity to offend others deliberately. Because that's just inflaming a situation. There's so much sensitivity around so many things today, and people do get offended by so much so quickly without any rhyme or reason. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now, over the weekend, it was reported that uh, Angela Rayner from the Labour Party, the Deputy Labour Leader, sold her house. The thing is, it was a former council house, and she got a profit on it, £48,000. Yes, and so she was able to buy her council house in Stockport back in 2007 at a 25% discount under the Right to Buy scheme, something which her party now have been campaigning to change. So... Uh, is she pulling up the ladder for those in her footsteps or is it time to reform the right to buy system? Now, we have a man called Ben Beadle in the studio. Ben's the chief executive of the National Residential Landlords Association. Now, Ben, on one side of all of this, I look and I go, what's the big deal? What's everybody getting their knickers in a twist about <laughs> this, this for? Um, there really isn't much of an argument here. I see that from one side, but I do have another argument contradicting that coming coming later. But first of all, she hasn't done anything wrong, has she? No, she's, um, she's done exactly what any other individual in social housing uh, could do. You know, we want to encourage people to uh, go on uh, and buy their home, and the Right to Buy scheme is a very good way of doing that. The difficulty is we're in the middle of a housing crisis, and specifically a social housing crisis. So, so that home is lost to the social sector. We've become very hell-bent on home ownership, both electoral, uh, both uh, po uh, political parties are are pushing the concept of ho home ownership, and that's right. But given we've got a massive uh, rental issue that people can't afford to stay in, 
I think this is a system that needs to be looked at. It's interesting because pe people have got their knickers in a twist because I suppose A, Angela Rayner has said so openly that she doesn't like the scheme and B, as we said in the intro there, is she kind of pulling the ladder up and not you know, helping out people who've been in her position before? Is that not a bit hypocritical? And I understand you're not a politician, <laughs> um, but is that is that a fair characterization? Will she be making it harder for other people coming through the system by, by doing what she's done? Well, the, the Labour Party have committed to looking at the level of the discounts if and when they get into power um, and the criteria of achieving those discounts. So, uh, and I think that's right, you know, you know, whether or not you call it hypocrisy uh, is, is another matter. Mm -hmm. As I say, you know, what she has done is available to everybody that's in social housing, depending on where you live and how long you've, you've been there. But I do think it's right that these uh, um, rules are looked at because we have an overall net loss in social housing. The social housing sector is not growing, it is shrinking. And Savills project that actually to 2030, we'll have 100,000 homes sold with 43,000 replaced. So a net loss of 57,000 homes. If you add in that we've got a two billion spend on temporary accommodation and landlords leaving the private rented sector, um, I, it does beg the question about where people will actually live. Yeah, you see, Ben, this is the big question. This is the second point that I had. This was me. In 1982, I lived in a, a council house, right? We rented the council house and whatever, and then it became available for us to buy. And it was an absolutely tremendous buy, and it was a great sense of um, prestige to be able to own your own house. That I get, and my parents lived in it and whatever, and that was great. My problem is, if it's then sold to someone else who needs a house, great. I don't like the idea of being sold to a landlord or someone who's then renting it at some huge amount that um, then just prices people out of the market. That's what I think it is. And, and, and you just the statistics you showed there. When, when we bought that house back in 1982, I assumed that our money was going, we were being rewarded and said, well done for being such great tenants and you can have this house at this discounted price. But obviously I'm thinking, and they're obviously going to build two or three more with the money that we have bought. That's the real problem. The problem isn't Angela Rayner. The Correct. problem is the government who are not replacing the sort of housing stock that you talked about there. Yeah, that's right. And the reality is, if you give those sizeable discounts, you're never going to be able to you know, replenish that stock when you have such a knockdown rate. There's discounts of up to 70% when it comes to social housing. So you're not going to be able to build a significant or any properties in today's climate. And that's the problem that we've, we've hit upon. Social housing is in decline. That stock has not been replaced. And that's the core issue here. So where do you actually have uh, people living? Um, and if you look at the private rented sector, which is there to pick up the slack, you've got landlords that are exiting the sector, which is hugely problematic because yes. they can't make things stack up. Mm -hmm. And this is bad news for the renter. Look, we just want to say to you, if you're renting, if you're looking to buy, uh, what do you think of this situation? GBviews at gbnews.com. Get in touch with us and um, let us know. Ben Beadle, thank you. Thank nice you. talking Pleasure. to you. Thank you very much indeed. Right, uh, Paul Coit will have all the latest sport coming up for us. I do. We're looking at uh, India versus England. England need five wickets. India need 40 runs. Who knows where it's going to end? And also a couple of legends of football that we lose as well or lost over the weekend we'll talk about. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster. And why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney. Weekdays from 3pm. Do you have a... a... President, in, uh, President Biden, who's not enforcing the law that was passed by Congress, President Obama, criticize him or not, actually enforced the law and, and was deporting people that had crossed illegally. Of course, President Trump enforced the law and improved the law to make sure that uh, and, and worked with Mexico to have the remain in, in Mexico policy. Biden has abandoned federal policy. In fact, he's deliberately trying to let in as many 
immigrants as possible. More, for, for the Democrats, more is better and less is racist. Just astonishing. And the statement that um, Greg Abbott put out is really feisty stuff. He said the federal government has broken the contract between the United States and the state of Texas. And in the, the eye numbers, Greg, are simply eye-watering. Six million illegal immigrants have crossed our southern border in just three years, Governor Abbott says. That's more than the population of 33 States that's in right. the United States. Astonishing numbers. And, and Martin, that's just Texas. If you add Arizona and other border states, you know, it's pushing 10 million. By the end of Biden's term, it'll be 11 million. A study by Yale University a few weeks ago, uh, three very liberal professors that did the study estimate there's 22 million illegal aliens. So this is a, a crisis that was created by the by Biden. It's it's what he wants. They want un unfettered access to to the border they're letting them in it's it's a real hardship on the on the working people of texas and other border states and now it's a real hardship on cities that the federal government as well as the governors of texas and other states are sending some of the migrants to those so-called sanctuary cities every sunday from 11 join michael portillo there'll be topical discussion looking at the week before and the week to come so kick back and relax at 11 a.m on sundays on gb news with me michael portillo gb news the people's channel britain's news channel We're going to begin Paul's sport this morning with um, people who have died, people who have passed away. And, um, you know, already a lot of people may have heard about Stan Bowles, who was an amazing uh, England and QPR uh, player. But Chris Nicholl, uh, yeah. former Northern Ireland captain and... Um, Aston Villa won the League Cup twice. Yeah. She died yeah. up the League Cup. Yeah. Southampton as well, 77. Um, it's, an, it's another dementia death, unfortunately, in football. You know, there's all the, the talk about the heading of the ball and how that's affected uh, their lives. And, and, and obviously, we, we've seen more and more of it over the years. Uh, but Chris Nook, he featured in a, a documentary with Alan Shearer called Dementia and Me, which was a few years ago, talking about how it's affecting his life. But unfortunately, he's passed away. But, you know, it's another, it's another player. I don't know about you. I don't know if this, this is the same with everybody. But we get to that certain age when it's players that I've seen yeah. playing football and then passing away. You know, it's one of those things where you think, oh, you know, it's like oh, he was 77. You know, for Stan me, the, 75. Well, the uh, Chris Nickel story, I mean, the Espana 82. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I was a reporter on that. And, uh, you know, and I just remember in the pictures I was seeing of Chris Nickel yesterday, is how you remember him and how you think he is, but obviously he's not Big, like tall, that anymore. Defender, strong. Yeah, you know. yeah. It was, it was, it's interesting, the difference between Chris Nicholl and Stan Bowles as players. And, of course, Stan, there was there's the story about this part uh, of him passing yesterday, but everybody has Stan Bowles stories. Yeah. Stories about, you know, about the fact that he would bet and he would go to the, uh, the latest, the, go to the betting shop just mm -hmm. before kick-off at Loftus Road. My favourite about Stan Bowles, do you remember, did you know he was in The Superstars? He actually took part in BBC Superstars. No, no, I didn't know that. So he apparently, and Stan Bowles, before I tell this story, was just one of the great Mavericks, one of the great footballers I've ever seen. Yeah. But in Superstars, he wasn't quite so good. So what happened is that he turned up at the Superstars, so there's all these great sportsmen he was going in against. He got the lowest score anybody's ever had in the Superstars. He went in the swimming competition, dived in, and at that point remembered that he couldn't swim. What do you mean he remembered he couldn't swim? It's just like you going into the superstars and then thinking he was going, well, I'll give it a go. Yeah, I'll give it a go. And then it was like, well, no, that's not going to work out. Then he did the pistol shooting. Do you remember they used to do the pistol shooting? The, the... Anyway, he shot the table and nearly managed to shoot the guy who was actually officiating the whole uh -huh. thing. It didn't go so well, no, superstars. No, wouldn't get you many and points. And he thought he was going to come back next year and they said, no, don't worry. <laughs> no. Don't worry, we're Too good. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. No. So Maverick on the field, off the field, but one of the true greats. Absolute great of football. Um, OK, let's get the latest in the cricket now from uh, India. It's the fourth test uh, from England yes, in India. Yes, it's down to... Well, it's India are slowly putting some runs on. So it looked like when they came out this morning that India were just going to walk this. It wasn't going to be any problem whatsoever. But England had taken five wickets. So it's possible... 
it's slightly more possible than when I was here, here an hour ago, yeah. but now it seems that they're scoring runs. So they need around 40 runs now, India, to win. England need five wickets. It's going to be very tricky. I but reckon. You never know. Get one, no. might get another one. Yeah. I reckon yeah. Liverpool is a happy place. Well, yeah. the red end of it's a happy place um, today. Um, pretty blue in Chelsea, I would have thought. I think most people wanted Liverpool to win this. I think it's probably it's, it's that whole underdog thing. You'd never see Liverpool as being underdogs. Well, the it's Klopp. So many injuries. Klopp in his last season. This Klopp farewell tour. Um, the, the fact they had so many injuries mm. um, as well. And um, Chelsea have spent so much money, people don't really wish them well. A billion, that's it. And yeah. there's all these players that cost £100 million that are just like... It was when Todd Bowley's gone, oh, we'll have that one. Oh, he's expensive, we'll have that one. Whereas... I think Mauricio Pochettino is building something. See, the average age, a lot of it, w was very similar to, to okay. Liverpool's. But the fact that there were so many reserves that were playing, that was the reason. It wasn't for me for Jurgen Klopp. It wasn't that I was wishing Jurgen Klopp well in his last season. He's done very well anyway. But I think it's for all the kids. You've got 18, 19-year-olds yeah. that were playing. So they were very good yesterday. Tell us about Joe Dean. Joe Dean's a golfer. Yeah. Uh, where does he rank in the world? Joe Dean, I've actually got the official ranking here. Now, young Joe Dean is the world number... 2930th. I'm 2,806. <laughs> yes, he's, so he's, he's two worth, below me. He's, yeah, yeah, and he's, you're just above him as well. Mm -hmm. He's a part-time part delivery driver. Um, so he goes... And this is tough. This is the side of professional sport where you're just trying to make a living. Played in the Kenyan Open over the weekend. So there was no uh, deliveries that weekend for Morrison's. Uh, carded a 67. He was 12 under for the competition. Ended up coming in second. One... £170,000 per second. Right. That's not so bad. So he can guy. take some time off from his delivery. I think he probably And work could. on his technique. Absolutely. And watch this space. It could change his fortune. 2,930 could go to like 2,450. <laughs> could score though, 12 so. under. Very and he good, finishes uh, 67. Yeah, thank you. Good stuff. Thanks, very good, Paul. Thank, thank you very you. much. Cheers. Uh, right, up next, Dawn Neeson, Chris Akabusi will be back in here with us. Uh, they'll be looking at all the stories making the news. Stay tuned to Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. The EU rules are trying to choke even that. Yeah, yeah. And I just think, you know, it's I would join this protest yeah. in a heartbeat. And, and you are right to point out this stuff about them being right-wing. How dare they yeah. slate them as right-wing when these these are these are real people whose livelihoods I are I remember a lot of people who work in the farm industry, Malone, they get paid very little money. They get paid, they Agricultural work. workers are very badly they, paid. They get paid nothing, Pierce. And, you know, the profits... I think on Clark and Spammer read somewhere that, that I saw that when you sell, it like, a sheep, a sheep's skin, yes. it's 30 pence That's or something. Right. And yeah. you say, what? Yeah. And, and, and so you, you, you wonder how they can manage that. And I think after a year, Clarkson made a handful of pounds. He made, like, 90 yeah. quid profit yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. In a whole year working. Um, but Carol makes a really good point, though, doesn't she, Nikki, about this idea that we eat... The, we go to the supermarkets, we yeah. shop there, we eat our food. We don't often give it a thing. And the farmers have become so frustrated by this idea that they are not respected. Absolutely. I mean, they're running what are effectively small businesses, often yeah. family businesses that are being passed down through generations. They also tend to know the land and the animals better than anyone else in those areas. You know, I am all for green protests, you know, I'm all for climate change activism, but actually... The only way you can do that is uh, gradually. The only, it's exactly what we've seen with Port Talbot. You know, you can't just go in and say, you're not going to do it anyway anymore this way. You're You've got to do it this way instead. The Tartar Steel thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You've got to do it this way instead. You know, I, lots of farmers are on board with protecting the planet, but they, they can't do it overnight. You've got right. to give them time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're protesting, you know, they're saying no farmers, no food. When well, you it say can't you get support any more obvious. some of these environmental protests, you're not one of these closet supporters of <laughs> Just Stop Oil, are you? <laughs> Closet supporter. I think You're I've been, out, I think I've been quite open about just oh, the oil. No. I don't like all their methods, but I do like the like message. Any of them. But I do appreciate I like the message. Yeah, but sometimes what you've got to do difficult Nikki, things. What they're asking for now, those protesters, are unrealistic. What these protesters are asking for is not unrealistic. No.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Uh, joining us now to go through what's making the news in the papers today, we have uh, Chris Akabusi and Don Neeson. Very nice to see you both. Um, Chris, young people increasingly blaming mental health problems for being jobless. No, is that the that's right last one? No, that's last one. No, 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 no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go to holiday makers. We'll have to pay more for flights this summer. Yes. Uh, yeah, so... Um, interesting. It just says Ryanair. I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's uh, affecting all... Um, aircraft um, owners, but um, Michael Louis says that due to some of the challenges with, with Boeing, they've had some recalls, that um, the 23%, no, 70% increase of last year could be, have, have a 10% increase this year and affect holiday makers um, going away. Now, it's a bit of a challenge, obviously, because uh, on, on, on the one hand, we talk about the green issues and environmental costs, etc., etc. But we all need a holiday, and there are more and more people flying away uh, this year than ever. Um, the people at Ryanair discount uh, airlines. You know what it's like. You get a, a ticket, basic 20 quid ticket to fly anywhere, but by the time you've added your... Um, other charges, you know, the accruals, bags and speedy boarding and more space, it's like a 200% increase or whatever it is. But so, no, I, ju I just looked at this and thought, will this stop people going on a holiday? Another 10% increase on your flights going ahead. It's hard ahead. to know because we were talking earlier about how M&S is the nation's favourite supermarket and yet here we are coming out of a cost of living cost crisis. Cost of living crisis. People do prioritise yeah. treats, don't you, they, You don't prioritise 10% more on a rubbish service. Yeah. And uh, although they'll say they, they go on time and all this sort of thing, I mean, generally, I've flown Ryanair once in my life and as far as I'm concerned, that would be the only time yeah. I flew them because I am not in the business, to would you like, Dawn? But I am not in the business of being pushed around like a cattle, uh, a piece of cattle, and um, you know, just not guarantee. I, I just the whole thing yeah. is not. It's a special thing to get on a plane, yeah. and I don't want to be treated like uh, some sort of. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, there's a couple. There's EasyJet. There's Ryanair, and I once once went on an EasyJet flight, and the manner that I got treated at. Oh, it, you thought I'll not be back here? Trust me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. No chance. Is, uh, the truth is even, you know, the sort of what Q's considered premium airlines now treat people with the, not disdain, yes. but they're under so much pressure. I think they're under um, a lot of pressure. You know, the cost so, pressures, but yeah. also the time pressures. It's just not fun to fly. Amy and I talk about this a lot. We just yeah. don't enjoy flying I, I, I think that the problem you've got is the airlines may be profiteering, we don't know for sure, but I think the people who are actually doing the jobs the front-facing people that are dealing with angry customers all the time, they're probably paid appearance as well. Yeah. They're trying yeah. to do a good job. They're under an awful lot of pressure. And they're the ones that bear the brunt of the frustration of people who have paid a fortune and get treated appallingly by an airline that rips them off simply for wanting to take some luggage on holiday with you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who'd have thought? I also wonder, you know, um, post-pandemic, I know that the airlines lost a lot of their experience um, yes, personnel, they did. didn't yeah, they? Yeah. So that then they had to quickly recruit, yeah. and you wonder, wonder whether the quality is there. Yeah. There's somebody who, you know, pre-pandemic loved their job, came to work because yeah. of their job, might have accepted a little bit of a lower fee, but loved interacting with customers. You know, and there uh, were some airlines that got rid of them as well. Ex absolutely, that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the worst thing about all airlines are the passengers. I mean, I could never do that job. <laughs> You've in a... flown with the husband then, have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, OK, so uh, Tory Peer calls on PM to denounce Anderson's remarks on Sadiq Khan. Let's talk about Lee Anderson. Yeah, absolutely. This is a story that everyone's talking about. It's in all the papers again today, as it was all weekend, obviously, as we know, Lee Anderson's comments about Sadiq Khan now. Um saying Islamists had got control of Sadiq Khan and that given the capital city to his mate, 
I think a, a, a lot of what Lee actually said has been sort of cut and spliced together to make it sound actually worse than it is. Do I think Lee Anderson's racist per se? No, but I think some of the language he chose was complicated. But this particular story is uh, Saeed Awasi, a Tory peer who was a cabinet minister under David Cameron, coming out and saying, why does Rishi Sunak find it so difficult to call out Islamophobia? Um, he, and you notice in Rishi's statement, he didn't use that word at all. He mentioned anti-Semitism and the rise of hate crime in general, and, and both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism have risen horrendously since the Gaza conflict. But Rishi didn't use that language, and you do have to wonder why. And it all goes back to, obviously, the scenes we saw in the House of Commons last week where you had uh, um, Sir Lindsay Holm making the decision he did. Now, was it because he was under pressure from Keir Starmer or was he genuinely felt for the safety of MPs because of the, the mob, and let's face it, they were a mob, outside? I mean, that's for Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Or, or is there a reason Prime Minister Sunak doesn't want to call it Islamophobia is because he knows he will alienate a core of his vote. This is what we come back to, And this to, is what the, the, the Telegraph have, have, yeah. have said. They've seen WhatsApps between Tory MPs yeah. who are saying, actually, our inbox is absolutely saturated with support for the and, and we know from the viewers and the listeners here today, uh, there is a, a similar strength of feeling out there. The 2019 Red Wall vote that Boris Johnson won for the Tories is very much swaying now. A lot of people thinking about reform now, 14% potential in that area, maybe voting for reform mm. rather than Conservatives mm. this time around. So I think they're worried about alienating mm. that votership. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that everybody who thinking that Lee Anderson may have had a point phrased badly but might have had a point is mm -hmm. racist and I think we should we expect MPs to dial down the rhetoric but I think it's for us all to dial down the rhetoric and stop okay. hurling the word racist at anybody that disagrees with you um, Is this next story racist <laughs> Chris uh, Foreign shoplifters, thieves and drug dealers are to be deported rather than prosecuted um, and put in prison oh, No I don't think it's racist at all I think actually it's a real, real good news um, Mr. Chalk, who I think is a prison officer, prison um, minister, minister, sort of minister yeah. pardon me, um, says that he wants to uh, reduce attention on the um, on the on the prison estate. Um, he struck a deal with Albania in negotiations in negotiations with Poland and Romania. At the moment, it costs the taxpayer 47k per annum for every inmate um, that um, is kept at His Majesty's um, service. Um, so it is, it is about time we tackle this. I know um, I read Rory Stewart's um, biography and he was a prison minister and, and, and really worked hard at reducing the strain mm -hmm. on a prison population. So it's good to see that he's handed the baton on and Mr Chalk is adamant about doing uh, getting to grips with this. He says his first, second and third priority is or was to increase prison capacity, but while they're getting on with doing that, it can reduce the inflow of inmates. Oh, because we're really good at deporting people in this country, aren't we? I mean, we're really good at putting people on planes, paying an extra 10%, it was already discussed, and getting rid of them. It's not going to happen. This is... I just... Honestly, with every politician now, of every political persuasion, I'm just not believing a word yeah, they say. I totally know what you mean. But they yeah. could say anything they want. I'm thinking, well, you probably won't be in power or you will be in power and it'll all change. It's just like... It's, it's, uh, uh, honestly, and well, we've got how long to go? November? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, I, what I will say, though, with this, I mean, you, you've got to have some policies and some sort of intention. If you don't have a focus, don't have an intention, you can't have a strategy, you can't deliver on your goal. So... You have too many lawyers who are saying... This is racist and this is wrong and you can't do this. Yeah, but, 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 if, but if you come to this country, if you come to this country, great, you crack on. But if you actually break the rules yes. and you are uh, a dangerous society, okay. off you go, son. I've had enough. Well, Especially in our prisons are absolutely packed. And they're yeah. talking about releasing prisoners early as well to make space. And this is, again, Justice Secretary Alice Shaw is announcing, another announcing, um, that inmates serving up to four years in prison may be let out to 18 years. He announced this in October, by the way, and it was meant to be a temporary measure. 18 days, is it? 18, earlier? 18 days earlier, right, under right, temporary. Right. Yeah. yeah, 18 days earlier. Um, under temporary, temporary measures, fast forward. Yeah. So now. Yeah. And guess what? And that's it's, becoming permanent. It's sort of becoming permanent. The end of custody supervised licensing was meant to be limited period in 21 jails. No. 
now it's kind of ongoing all over the prison surface. Well, but, I mean, the, the there, thing... there, there is a whole uh, burglary scheme going on whereby people fly in from Ecuador and Colombia and various things, and they come and they all land at Heathrow, and uh, then they get cars, they're picked up, and they're sent to various places in Surrey, for instance, I don't know, uh, to burgle. That's what they do. They spend a weekend burgling, getting all the stuff to a, to a warehouse or whatever it is, and then they jump on the plane and head back again. Yeah. And no one seems to be able to do anything about it. It's well known it happens, yeah. and um, it's been going on forever. And they and they, they carry knives as well on the all It ties all into the front page of The Sun where this premiership footballer has decided to keep mm. an XL bully dog yeah. because he just feels like there's nothing being done to protect them. They're being targeted, yeah. and actually these these scary dogs are the only solution. Yeah, but you've got to be very careful. And again, this is about 30 years ago, there was a, a, a policeman was in charge of British Athletics, and I used to carry, uh, keep a, uh, a baseball bat in my bedroom yeah. in case someone decided yeah. to come in. And he certainly told me that you use that That's some of the bits and you think your little person's going to get done. Yeah. So, um, and I, you know, at that 30 years ago, I had a young family. Yeah. You know, I was, I, you know, I'm, I wasn't a superstar, as it were, but, you know, I, I was where I was living, I thought to myself, hmm, yeah, I'll, I'll, if someone comes into my bedroom, mate, you, you, or come into my house, you're going to use it. Got, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, surely yeah. that's self-defence. No, but you can't. You know, no. but yeah, but, but, it's, but it's undue force. So, so, so I mean, I could say, I should say to the burglar, excuse me, sir, I think you got the. Yeah, anything. I think I think you come to the wrong address. Would you mind yeah. leaving? Yeah. He, he, he can't. He bangs you the door. Bam over the head. Well, <laughs> you know what? And I think that's why Lee Anderson is getting a lot of support. It seems like the ordinary, hard-working people of this country genuinely feel like they don't have a voice anymore. And these are the people that are suffering. And I think that's what all the politicians need to start thinking long and hard about, mm. rather than making these airy-fairy promises about, oh, we'll do this and we'll do that. Listen to what people are saying to you, because they're not listening to us. Well, look, listen to this. Uh, hundreds of criminals are set to be freed early under an expansion of a scheme to relieve pressure on crammed prisons. Now, this is what... Okay. This happens. They All the politicians, they stand up and they say, we we'll give these people tougher sentences. Do they mean it? No, they well, do not the mean problem. it. This is the temporary scheme that is now expanded to all prisons. Um, you know, it, 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 look, 18 days early, it was temporary. It's not temporary, it's now permanent. It excludes people serving a life sentence um, for well, various... Well, that's Yeah, I know. <laughs> Rapists, you're fine, oh. Isabel. Rapists, you're sure? Well, no, not entirely sure, because offenders guilty of domestic abuse crimes also may oh, be eligible, so there you go. Yeah. Uh, so there's a get-out clause there. You see, here's the one thing that politicians need to understand. Nobody, nobody objects to more of their tax being paid on prison spaces. Am I right or wrong? Uh, I think you're right. I can think. I mean, the, the prison space is 110.6% over capacity at the moment. And, yeah. well, I think. Yeah. Oh, you could also argue they don't even need to spend more. They just put more in one room. Like, why do they all have to have their own rooms? That's and their a own good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Why does it have to be the gyms and <laughs> yeah, exactly. all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah put yeah, a yeah. few more in. It's supposed to be a deterrent, isn't it? Isn't prison supposed to be a deterrent? Not. I, I think I, without sounding like the lefty in the corner, I, I do think there is a place for rehabilitation oh, in yeah. prison uh, as well. Yeah. So I wouldn't just wholesale say sort of like. Lock but when I joined the army, when I joined the army, there were six men in my bedroom. <laughs> like no, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. <laughs> oh, Lisa, stop it, stop it. Is it a big bedroom? Yeah. Well, we're big enough, I mean, like the space of here. So, yeah, yeah about, uh, what is it? Like, uh, six men and a baseball bat. Six, that six men, wild, six beds, right? six lockers, <laughs> six, six drawers. Yeah, we all... Yeah, so if it's not good enough for me as a soldier, exactly. why is it not good enough for... Exactly. Fair point. Yeah, get a few it. of them out there picking up some litter. I that's totally what I would say. Agree. Or oh. fixing oh. potholes. Yeah, paint the grass green. Potholes. That's what we should do. Paint the grass green. We should paint the grass green. Nothing wrong with it. It's hard work's <laughs> okay. good for everybody. Well, I, absolutely, yeah. Guys, see Thank you in 45 we'll you minutes. Again. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're starting the week and we're starting your day on this Monday morning with a weather update. And goodness me, it's wet. Here's Jonathan. That warm feeling inside. From Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, very good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast though we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off but elsewhere a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea that is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll stop pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up, turn lighter and patchier as we head throughout the day to the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we'll turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Camilla Tomini Show, Sunday mornings from 9.30. Uh, we had Grant Shapps on last week. He was talking about how defence spending is now creeping up to two and a quarter percent of GDP. Ben Wallace's uh, predecessor suggested it should be three percent. We hear that we've got the smallest army, I think, since the Napoleonic Wars. Numbers are get down. There's a question as to whether we can staff frigates in the Red Sea. Why haven't we sent aircraft carriers? What's your impression of the situation? Well, I don't think it matters how much you spend, it's how effectively you spend it. And we spend it very ineffectively. We have lots of scandals about defence spending. And I think partly because of the monopoly position of some of our defence suppliers, we don't get uh, good value and we don't get reliability. This latest story in The Telegraph is that HMS Diamond, which is our ship, which is out there uh, defending the Red Sea, doesn't have the capability of firing a missile from the ship to the land, so it can't participate in the attacks on the Houthis. So in order that we can participate in the attacks, we are flying RAF aircraft from Cyprus, yeah. which is miles. a very long way away. Um, when I was Defence Secretary, I ordered um, cruise missiles for our nuclear-powered, uh, but not nuclear-armed, submarines. And I think we have six or possibly seven of those. But last autumn, it was reported that five of those were out of commission, were not available. Uh, we have about 21 aggressive surface ships. So we've got two aircraft carriers, then we've got frigates, and we've got um, destroyers. But at any one time, you can count on about uh, half of those not being available because they're under refit or whatever. So we have a minimal uh, surface fleet now. And for whatever reason, it doesn't seem that we're able to deploy a submarine to the area that can fire cruise missiles. Our two aircraft carriers, built at enormous expense, are sitting in Portsmouth. Which seems to most people ludicrous, well, at least it, with what's going on. It doesn't seem thing. ludicrous to me. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
8 o'clock on Monday the 26th of February. Very nice to have you on board. This is Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Divisions within the Conservative Party are deepening as the Prime Minister is facing a red wall backlash over Lee Anderson's sacking. However, one former party chairman hit side arguing the Tory party has been, is being dragged into the gutter. Levelling up in action or another broken promise, the government announces a £4.7 billion local transport fund to be shared by the North and the Midlands. The whole point is it's not for ministers to set those priorities, it's for councils to set them. We think those decisions are better made closer to the people that are going to benefit from them. From sick notes to skipping job interviews and even their first day of work, are Generation Z and Millennials lazy? We'll be debating that later. And in the sport, India are closing in on winning the fourth test against England unless an absolute miracle happens. You never know. Sixth tier mates from United play Coventry in the FA Cup fifth round tonight. And Brendan Rogers says the wrong thing to a female reporter. It's a fine start to the week for many of us with some sunny spells on offer, but how long will it last for? Join me later to find out all the details. Well, the top story this morning is the row over claims of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party deepens. Yes, according to the Telegraph newspaper, leaked WhatsApp messages from some Tory MPs have raised concerns over Mr Anderson's suspension. MPs fear they could see a revolt from voters who will now move to the Reform Party after being flooded with supportive messages about Lee Anderson. However, Baroness Saeed Varsi, a former party chairwoman and the first Muslim cabinet member, now appear in the House of Lords, has accused the Conservatives of being dragged into the gutter as she criticises the party's response to this latest crisis. Uh, earlier we spoke to the Transport Secretary on why Lee Anderson had the whip removed. I think what Lee Anderson said about the Mayor of London was wrong. And the reason, and he was given the chance to retract those comments, and to apologise for making them. He didn't do so, and that's why the whip was removed very swiftly, and I think that was the right decision. Well, joining us this morning is Dr Krish Kandai, Director of the Sanctuary Foundation. Good morning to you. Good morning, you. Isabel. Um, look, he stopped short of saying that what uh, Lee Anderson had said was Islamophobic, but said it was wrong. What are your views on what was said? I think what Lee Anderson said, and indeed what Suella Braverman wrote earlier in the week, is Islamophobic. The Oxford... Uh, English Dictionary's definition of Islamophobia is this, intense dislike or fear of Islam, especially as a political force. Well, that's exactly what Lee Anderson was doing. And so I think we need to call that out. Uh, it's often said not all equalities are equal. Imagine someone had said that Jewish people had taken over our country or, or even were influencing our mayor. That would be rightly called out as anti-Semitism and we need to fight against anti-Semitism at every cost. And we ought to do the same to protect our Muslim citizens. Not only is it Islamophobic, I, I think it's actually anti-British. We ask all new citizens of Britain to make an oath to stand by British values, and that includes things like democracy, rule of law, but also tolerance of people <coughs> with different beliefs and faith. Uh, people here who know Lee Anderson will tell you he's not a racist man. He, he himself said that the language he chose was, was clumsy, and what he was trying to talk about were controversial and complicated and complex issues. Do you recognise that what Lee Anderson was doing was trying to verbalise concerns that a huge number of people in this country have, where they feel as though this isn't the country they once knew, that they are not necessarily being represented in the way that they would like. Is that a fair point, do you think? I don't think so, actually. I think this was a calculated statement to try and whip up fear and division. And that isn't the country that I think most people want to live in. Uh, we're known as a nation for being incredibly hospitable, fair and kind. And so th these are not British values that our uh, politicians are demonstrating. Uh, Pauline, Lee Anderson speaks for all the red wall areas, such as Oldham, where I live. Uh, Chris, Lee Anderson speaks for me. The obvious and dangerous bias is the way London's being run has to be called out, no matter how unpalatable the woke keyboard warriors find it. I mean, there are differing opinions in all of this. Um, but how do we move on from talking about things which affect you know, the hatred effectively in, in Parliament. And we saw what happened last week when there was supposed to be a vote on a very serious issue and it ended up being a row about parliamentary procedure. 
Do you think we can ever recover from this hatred that's in British politics now? I really believe we can, and we must. I mean, again, this weekend, three female MPs were telling us they didn't feel safe and they, they needed protection and security just to do their job. So I think we've got to do it, and we need our politicians to show some moral leadership, actually, mm. not be bowed by um, what the polls are saying, but actually do the right thing, live lives of justice and integrity, and, you know, this removing the whip is the right thing, but I think we need an apology. Need an apology, OK. Um, I, I just want to ask you, just because we were talking last hour with the uh, former uh, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. He's still a member of the Israeli Knesset. Um, and he was talking to us this morning about how he thinks that the Rafa assault should continue. Now, obviously, you do a great deal of charity work um, and care greatly about the Middle East. What would you say to what he was saying to us this morning um, about the Rafa um, assault that the Israelis are planning at the moment? Look, the world is in outrage at what happened on the 7th of October, and we need to get hostages back uh, from Hamas as soon as possible. But there are a million people that are now in a very vulnerable situation in Rafa. They were told to remove themselves from all parts of uh, Gaza in order to escape the bombing, and now a ground assault, that is just going to lead to devastating civilian casualties. I I'm hearing from doctors telling me that because of uh, the fighting, there are 10 amputations a day taking place of children, often without anaesthetic. This is a humanitarian crisis, and we don't want to add more loss of life into this. Uh, and there's UN warnings as well of a growing risk of famine. You'll have seen the pictures over the weekend, yeah. children without shoes on and, and, and nothing to eat, empty bowls. How hopeful... I mean, you're a man of hope. That I is, am. you know, you, you always give out that energy. Uh, we've had these talks in Paris over the weekend. There's possibly going to be continuation of those in Qatar this week. Do you think there is a sense that perhaps the tide is turning, that almost within touching distance, ceasefire, return of hostages could happen? Well, I, I want to believe it's possible. I, I'm not hearing any backing down from uh, Mr Netanyahu, but we are hearing the Americans and maybe even the Brits calling for a humanitarian ceasefire. So the world's opinion is turning. Whether that will stop Mr Netanyahu from something I think would be an absolute atrocity, I'm not sure. OK. Dr Krish Kandaya, thank you very much indeed. Now, joining me in the studio, Kazim Ali Balugan, and, uh, and we're going to also be speaking to down the line, Paul Bentz, and they're talking housing, both of them. And uh, Kazim, we're talking, Pierre Starmer's going out and about today. It always makes, always cracks me up. These politicians, they go out and about, and they know nothing about what they're talking about. They know nothing about your industry or yeah. what's required and whatever. And they're going to make out that they have got the answer to everything, that we need no housing. We need more housing. Seriously. Um, you know, it's obvious we do. Why don't they speak about it before this? Why do they leave it till today? Because they know there's an election happening and then you never hear about it again. Tell me about your industry, the building trade. What do you need? I think we need to streamline the planning process. I think for a lot of people, whether it be for owner occupiers or for builders, the planning process is very stretched. Local councils are, you know, sort of at their wits end. It doesn't matter who you are, we find that it, it, the processes differ from council to council. I think standardisation, more investment to allow a simpler, faster process. Yeah, why are we not getting that? I just think it's a lack of budget. And I think yeah. when we look at things like saying, OK, there's not a budget to even fund the people in the planning department, yet we want to say we're going to commit to 1.5 million new homes. And I think people are really tired of these big sensationalised... Yeah, heard it all before. Exactly. And I think people just want to focus on things that... What can make an impact in the here and now, as opposed to yeah. 10, 15 years <clears throat> down the line? Well, I, I just honestly don't believe anything will make a difference because I don't believe any of them are committed to it. And you're right, I don't think the funds are there for local authorities or, or to come from central government. Let's go to Paul Bentz. Now, Paul, you're interesting because you're an owner of Bentz Builders Merchants. It's a family business. <coughs> You've been on the go for nearly 200 years, for goodness sake. Incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so you're part of, you're the sixth generation to run the business. So yep. if we are to make more house building happen, and you've heard what Kazim is talking about, about um, lack of funding, what do you think has to happen? Well, look, um, morning, team. I, I, I'm nodding away here at your words, Eamon and, and Kazim now. I, I totally agree what, what, what you said down. And look, it's really tough trading conditions at the moment. Uh, I, I feel every year of 170 years uh, at the moment, last year we were we were down double digits in volume. And I think some of the non-financial things that can be helped with, we're looking at um, 
the, the Bills Merchant Federation are, are really pushing to get 15,000 apprenticeships through before 2030. And I think that will really help play a part in the building material sector. But the to, interesting, to the interesting the thing about you, Paul, you believe a lot of those apprenticeships should be going to women. Tell, tell us why that's so important. Um, there's a there's there's a skills gap, but there's also a massive gender gap as well. I mean, this this last year, the stats are showing that there's the most females ever employed in our industry at 325,000. There's been a, a good spike, but that's only 15 percent. There's there's two million males still, uh, and, and we need to change that stigma and stereotype that it's just a place uh, for, for for males. Do you it's know why we do need to, to change that? My wife my wife says to me all the time when we're in a hotel, she'll say. What man designed this room? Because because there won't be a plug beside a mirror. There will be there'll be completely things that'll stop her drying her hair or yeah. doing whatever she's supposed to do. Or you know there will be uh, cupboards or, or wardrobes that will have half half length, so you can't l hang a full dress. You know what I'm yeah. saying here. Yeah, whatever well, it is. I know. I my um, mum worked in the building industry her entire career, and, and she was an architect, and she was constantly the only woman on the building site um, dealing with, with builders every day. And it's definitely a design thing. There need to be more women in the sector. So if there's more women working in your business, there's more women seeing it that way, that practical way as well, instead of all stupid really? blokes uh, be, being there. Um, what would you like to say about that, Kazi? I think definitely, um, you know, more opportunities for people getting into, you know, trades at an earlier stage is definitely going to help bring up the quality, the quantity of available trades um, to help push the industry forward. Mm. And I think just from an education perspective as well, in terms of more housing, getting more people on, on the housing ladder, I think having conversations about financial literacy at an earlier stage would really help, you know, bridge the gap between the young home ownership. Oh, oh. And what about the planning laws? Because I know that everybody from both colours of mm. party, everyone says we're going to reform the planning laws, but at the end of the day, all of us, and we talked about this just last week on, on the programme, all of us want where we live to be nice. And I suppose there's an innate fear, isn't there, always, that someone's going to come along and plonk some horrendous housing development right in your, in your neighbourhood. Planning is important. So how do you reform planning laws to enable, as Labour want to do today, £1.5 million, pound, sorry, 1 .5 million new homes without upsetting everybody and also ruining what, I guess, is yeah. what makes it so beautiful? I think, I think an element of standardisation, as I touched on earlier, if people understand what's required, what you want in a local area, you know, the, the people within the building trade are going to want to provide, you know, attractive, nice looking homes. But I think there's an, a disconnect between sometimes you can do something in one borough, it's completely different yes. in terms of requirements in another borough. I think. Do think Does anybody, let me ask you this, right? Mm -hmm. So I started to take an eye and look for bungalows. Mm -hmm. I know what type of bungalow I would want and whatever. There's no chance of getting bungalows. Why, why are bungalows in such short demand? I guess it's the footprint they generally take up, being a detached building um, that takes up a large footprint. A lot of the time... So you could build a bigger building and get more money for it on the same patch of land? Effectively. Effectively, yes. effectively. Um, what, what would you do, Paul? Well, you've listened to us talking here in the studio. What do you need? How is business with you, for instance? Uh, it, it, it's not brilliant, um, but it's not that bad. And I think when you look at our industry, it's, a, it's the first uh, industry to sort of push the country uh, economy back to, to a good place. Uh, may I also say, I don't think you're old enough yet for a bungalow, Eamon. <laughs> um, and uh, you, there's a lot of large house builders set on banks of land at the moment because, as Kazim said, the planning process is taking too long and especially the appeal process. So that needs to speed up. But another one, an interesting one, is the tax relief taken away on landlords a few years ago. Um, and a lot of them are selling up now. So, so I think that needs to be looked at. Um, and look, whilst I've got my shopping list out here, you know, the government could look at a stamp duty holiday to really stimulate building oh, too. Do you ever think, I don't know if this is just me, but do you ever, as you're driving around or going to work in, in your cases, look at buildings that are being put up today and think, that's going to look rubbish in 100 years? Do you ever just think, we're all so short-sighted, we shove stuff up, and, and you know, so many of our buildings have lasted so many hundreds of years and look so beautiful, but we, we design so cheaply now. Is that a problem, do you think, in the sector, Paul? Um, to a certain degree, yeah. I mean, obviously, designs and trends change over 100 years, and I'm sure when we look back at 100 years now, some of the stuff we build won't look great. Um, I don't see that as being much of an issue in the industry at the moment. 
And the, the other thing that I think could be changed is the way we look at uh, mortgages. You look at the interest rates at the moment, okay, they're leveled out, they're still too high, but you look at what, what happens over in Europe, I believe recently in Italy, they did a fixed term of 2% on your, your whole mortgage for the house. And, and they look at it differently to us sort of from a two to five year uh, or variable rate. They look at it, you know, let's try and do a rate for 10 years, 15 years. And I think that's something that we're well, a bit blind to over here. I want the two of you to think of what you would tell Keir Starmer. We're going to listen to a lot of platitudes from him today. Uh, I don't believe, as I say, a word of what, what he'll say will ever come to fruition. Um, but, Kazim, first of all, what would you think Mr Starmer needs to hear today, or indeed uh, Mr Sunak? I think they need to look at the more shorter-term solutions. Paul touched on it in regards to mortgage rates and helping you know, owner-occupiers first and foremost. So I think a lot of people are renting, paying a high amount of money for rent, have been paying it for a considerable amount mm -hmm. of time. And I think being able to use that track record of a renter to allow you to borrow at the same amount, I think would help a lot of people. I think also, you know, just... Yeah, I, th I, th I think just... The reform in general for in, in terms of planning would really help. So they spoke very briefly about changes in um, being able to convert a house into two flats. I think we're having smaller families now. That potentially would work because converting large houses means potentially you can stay in an area yes. you'd want to live in, live near mum and dad, as opposed to having to move further outside of London. So as, well. as, as the demography of the area changes, then so should the use of the, the buildings change as well. And final final word to you, Paul, what would you say? Yeah, um, tax relief, stamp duty, um, look, it's feast and famine in, in our industry. And I, and I think that, you know, whoever's in government in the next six to 12 months, they, they really need to, to, to push and, and think a lot more. As you said, Eamon, you know, they don't, I don't know if, if, if it's just words at the moment, but they need to help us start building again. Mm. Good man. OK, good luck to you. Have a good season, Paul, Kazim. Thank you both thank you. very thank much you. indeed. Thank you very much. So we're going to have, um, just after 9 o'clock, aren't we? We've got somebody we've from got Labour. Annalise Dodds, yes, yeah. coming to talk to us about this uh, patriotic economy that the Labour Party wants to talk about today, including turbo-boosting. Now, do you, know, do you know what I could do on a Saturday mm. and Sunday mm. all day? Mm -hmm. Well, if I wasn't going to football. <laughs> I could go to a show home. Yeah. I love show. I love, I love car show showrooms room, yeah. and I love new house, house showrooms. And I love the idea of walking around the house and they always think I'm going to buy and I'm not <laughs> going to buy, of course. And they go, oh, are you interested in this, Mr Holmes? And I say, yes. And I mean, no, I'm not. But I do love to see, you know, whether you're moving up or whether you're moving down, I think you should see as many homes as possible because then you get an idea yeah. whether this is good value yeah. or not good value. And Paul, and Paul was saying there about me looking at bungalows, but you sort of get to a stage, I know what type of bungalow I want. Yeah. I want a modern, gosh, I'd love a sea view. That would be incredible. Oh. Um, but I know I want something that's a bit huff housey, yeah. you know, like that. And, um, and I'd be very definite about that. But uh, as I was just saying to Kazim there, it is so hard. Yeah. Well, no one's building yeah. new bungalows, nobody. Well, exactly, yeah, no, but I do agree. There's nothing quite like taking your shoes off, walking through the plush carpets, oh, yes. the smell of a yes, show home. Smell. Oh, I'll have a coffee. And there's always you know. a very attractive woman <laughs> selling it. <laughs> it was very glamorous, aren't they? I actually bought the last show home I looked round. Did you? It was pouring with rain. We used to live on a level crossing, and the crossing was down all the time to let the trains through. It was pouring with rain, and there was a show home. And I thought, oh, I'll just go and have a look around there to get out of the rain. And then I was blown away by how much light there was. It was really yes. ugly from the outside. Yeah. But I thought, oh, it's so lovely and light. So we bought it. That was well, my it was, first house. Well, it was a nice buy. It was, yeah, it was, it was did a nice job. Buy. Did Very the nice. job. And then she bought a haunted house after that. <laughs> I so bought the complete did. polar opposite. Completely yeah. opposite. So it was all nice and smart and whatever it is, small. Yeah. And this now one's it's massive and... Um, freezing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's old. Let's just say it's old. But there we go. Uh, the weather update. We go to Jonathan for that. Here's your picture on this Monday. Hello there, there, good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast though, we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing, so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off. But elsewhere, a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea. That is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll stop 
pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up to lighter and patchier as we head throughout the day to so the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we'll turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. Still to come. From sick notes to skipping job interviews and even their first day of work, are Gen Z and Millennials lazy? We're, we're debating that next. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Elon Musk has announced that the first patients to receive a groundbreaking brain implant <laughs> from Neuralink is recovering well. This is all a bit odd. Uh, the product, called Telepathy, uses a robot to surgically place a computer chip in a region of the brain that controls movement. <laughs> yes, Elon Musk says that the first goal is to enable people to control a phone or a computer just by thinking. He says that initial tests show promising signs of brain activity, meaning that patients with paralysis could one, one day overcome their conditions. Hmm, not sure about this one. Joining us to discuss this breakthrough is applied futurist Tom Cheesewright. Tom, this sounds, uh, well, slightly terrifying. <laughs> I certainly think a lot of people will be thinking this is something out of a sci-fi horror rather than reality. But this is a technology that's been a long time coming. We've been developing direct brain computer interfaces for a long time, mostly for the sort of therapeutic reasons that are the initial goal, at least, of Elon Musk's Neuralink, to allow people who are perhaps quadriplegic to have direct control via their brains of initially a smartphone uh, and maybe ultimately artificial limbs or a wheelchair. It does seem fascinating how quickly this technology is moving on. I, I saw demonstrations perhaps a year or two ago of people playing a very simple Pong game just by thinking, moving sort of one uh, line on a screen up and down. This seems like potentially there has been a breakthrough that means far more complex things can be controlled just by thinking. Well, there's lots of different aspects to this technology. The initial attempts to interface with the brain used actually quite thick prongs almost that went into the brain and they were quite solid and so if the brain moved they could potentially cause damage. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. So join me, Tom Harwood, for the Rochdale by-election results. From midnight through to 6 a.m., we'll discover the twists and turns of the most unpredictable by-election in a long time. You're not a big fan. He should be celebrating. I just left here again, you know. <laughs> we'll be there for every second of it, right through from midnight. Thursday on GB News, Britain's election channel. Now, it's a term you may have heard in reference to dating, ghosting. But have you ever ghosted a potential employer?
You've not turned up to a job interview or not fancied it? No. no. Well, a new report has revealed 79% of Generation Z and Millennials have admitted to ghosting a future employer by not showing up at their interview or even not rocking up to their first day of work. Cocky. Oh, yeah. <coughs> or stupid. Um, today, a new report has revealed more young people than ever are blaming their mental health to take days off work as well. OK, co-founder of Intergenerational Foundation, that's Angus Hatton. Good morning, Angus. And there we have broadcasting legend, uh, a man never has an opinion. But anyway, <laughs> Mike Parry uh, joining us uh, both there. So, Mike, could you, could you ever imagine, I mean, the, you and I, same generation, we know how yep. valuable jobs are. Um, yep. I, I can't think, mate, I'm always grateful to get a job. Well, look, I'm a gentleman entering early middle age, and I don't want to start banging the drum and going on about I got my first job when I was 13, you know, as a newspaper delivery boy, and I've had half a dozen jobs between then and going to university, and I've worked every day since because I wanted to. But I'm afraid we have to accept that the modern generation do not always see work as a lifestyle which attracts them. I know this because I've spoken to young people who say, why would I want to get up in the morning at five o'clock and go out to work and come back at six o'clock at night? That's not the way to run your life. And I think they're aided and abetted in that sort of feeling by A, a very generous welfare system in this country, but also parents who are too touchy-feely. Older people who have a responsibility to guide younger people through life are far too uh, keen and far too able to say to them, oh, it's not your fault. Oh, don't worry, darling. You know, or are you depressed and all that? Now, I also think that social media has a huge part to play in this because people want to get rich quick. Young girls of um, Generation Z, millennials, want instant gratification through social media. And I've met a lot of young men who are still opening up their laptop every day and hoping to discover, you know, the magic formula to bring in the millions of pounds like Facebook or something like that, who simply aren't prepared to put in the hard work okay. over not just years, but decades to establish their okay. own life. So, Angus, what do you say to all of that? That There's a level of entitlement, Mike thinks, and perhaps we're mollycoddling the young too much. I don't think there's evidence for that. I think what we've what we've got is an, a generation that works really hard. Many of them have two jobs. Uh, perhaps com, com, in, in relation to Mike's comment about getting up at five in the morning, perhaps the younger generation are more interested in working smart rather than working long hours. Um, but the other thing is we've loaded so much onto them. A lot of them have very long commutes because housing is so expensive near to where they want to work. Um, most of them have been, well, we've all been through the COVID crisis, but they've done so at a time that was more critical for them. It was more difficult for their education. Um, I, I'm, I'm, re I'm really not, not at all sure that they're, that they're, they're mollycoddled. Um, we try to look, do what we can for our children. But, but uh, I think they're a very hardworking generation. And I think they had a very raw deal from the older generation, from us baby boomers. Um, and they're, they're quite aware of that. But Angus. But they're not what they can do about it. When you say you're not sure the evidence is there, I mean, this report found 79% <coughs> of Gen Z and millennials have admitted ghosting an employer or not turning up for their first day of work. I mean, that's shocking to me. Well, it'd be interesting to know what, what um, percentage of the older generation have done comparable things. I mean, we humans not are not altogether... We're not, we're not always reliable about everything. And um, it, it, there, are, there are different sort of work cultures. Um, I think most younger people are very reliable. Um, mm. And what they're saying is not that they normally do this, but that they have done this at least once in their life. Well, there may well have been a good reason for that, some sort of personal crisis or whatever. So, um, so yeah. I, I, I don't think it's at all fair to say that younger generations are less reliable. No, I don't know, all... Mike. Something, some, something's changed. Uh, Angus is saying there that, you know, we have saddled them with commuting and whatever. But you had commuting. I had commuting. I had a milk grind before I went to a job before. Yeah. I had. I then I worked on TV and did the tea time news and then would work in a yeah. bar that evening. I'd serve them up the news and then it served them up pints afterwards. I really don't get it. I, I'm, what I'm thinking, what I'm getting to, Mike, is maybe my yeah. need was better. Maybe my uh, drive to get on in the world was stronger. Maybe the bank yeah. of mum and dad looks after too many youngsters today. Yeah, no, that could well be it. There's 9.25 million people economically inactive in this country, right? And that in itself is such a horrifying figure. Why should young people say, 
well, why can't I be part of that part of society rather than the working part of society? Because the 9.25 million seem to do all right. They can go to the pub every day. They can spend their welfare benefits money. I'm not knocking people who are out of work. I'm just saying we have a huge welfare budget. At my local pub, and you know, Eamon, I don't spend much time in my local pub, but the landlady there tells me all the time, I've got two new youngsters starting tomorrow, and they simply don't turn up. Or we've had this experience, they've turned up, and after about five hours of the first shift, have decided this is not for me. There is an issue here, I think, with young women, because in one of these reports, I noticed that the number of young women self-harming over the last decade has gone up considerably. And again, I think that's down to social media and young women wanting to instantly hit the heights of fame or try and make themselves a success. But when they then relate to people, their problems, they feel uh, depressed, they feel they're not winning, unfortunately, they're then given medication. Instead of being given, you know, a, a sensible adult talking to, life isn't always fair. You know, you don't always get it first time in life. Keep trying. And, you know, a lot of adults allow them just to take the avenue of it's mental health problems. I'm not knocking mental health. Some people do have mental health problems. But I think the bar has been lowered considerably to the level where mental health now can be confused with other things. OK, well, a final thought from you, Angus, because I know that you, you just have concerns that the way we, we talk about young people, we almost other them a little bit. And in actual fact, we should try to find what we have in common and, and support generations and, and, and try and find a positive out of all of this. Give us a positive to end on, if you will. <laughs> well, I, I'm agreeing with that negative. I mean, there's a danger that we're, we're treating them as victims and we're blaming the victims. Um, we ought to be treating them as... A, 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 generation that we should cherish and encourage and yeah Mike's right there are there are issues about how we how we deal with mental health but um, I think the younger generation are extremely smart um, extremely positive and my experience of, of them has been that they they're constantly teaching us how to use technology and so how to true. interact differently <laughs> and inventing inventing new words that are really useful um, I, I've got only admiration for the younger generation Thank you, Angus. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you yeah. both very, very much indeed. A lot to think about there and, and talk about. I think uh, sometimes younger people are frightened as well, but frightened with what's out there and frightened if they're mm. qualified for it and not really sure if their employers will like them and things as well. But, you know, it is, I mean, I'm looking at Paul here. It's, um, I mean, I know you were a grafter. I was a grafter. Yeah, a grafter, yeah, yeah, yeah. grafter. But I just thought you had no other choice but to go out and, and do it. And you know what? I really enjoyed it. There was jobs that I knew that I was never going to stick at in life because yeah. they, were, they were so awful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, but they spurred me on in, in other ways. You know? I, I think so. And, but the thing is, we, we do jobs and wanted to do jobs since we were very young and knew what we wanted to do. Uh, I think the other things, I think being a London tour guide for £1.50 an hour, that was four or four times a day was a bit tough, but I stuck it out. Yeah. I did. I saw through a few summers. Mm -hmm. I might have lied with all the things I told Americans, but apart from that, it was, it was a tough job. <laughs> I'd but, love to go on a Paul Coit tour of London. Oh, I tell you, it's good. Yeah, you yeah, do yeah. that with your kids just on an open-top bus? Absolutely. Been... Anybody who will sit on a bus with me <laughs> on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, down on the right-hand side, yeah. I used to love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, when I left school, I was accepted for journalism college, and I grit for told my mother and she said I said I'm going to journalism school mum and she said no you're not you go out and get yourself a job oh did she she said I need a wage coming into yeah. this yeah and it just shows you I listened to my mother yeah and I went and got a job in Primark right and um tough 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 anybody who works in retail and that then convinced me that after a year of being in there I said to my mum I said, I don't care what you say or what you do, I'm not working in Primark anymore. The hours, the demands, the sure. physicality of it all. And I said, I'm going, I'm going to journalism college. Mm. And I said, and I'm working in a pub at night and you can have all the money from that. So that's basically how I balanced the books um, with her. But the thing, what the Primark thing did to me, it was so hideously awful that I, it, may, it drove me on in journalism because yeah. I thought, I'm not going to lose this job. Yeah.
I did. Uh, sorry, I went for I went for lots of jobs. I remember going through the back of the Evening Standard and, and leaving college and thinking I had a friend that they went to banks, they worked in the city, they're all making loads of money. I wanted to do something a bit different. I remember seeing an advert for trainee. I never forget this trainee private detective. Oh, right. and I thought, so good at that. And I thought I'd love the sound of that. So I I still remember this is absolutely true. I phoned up and I said, look, I'm phoning for the job for private, private uh, trainee private detective. And I was like 16. And the woman said, do you have any experience? And I said, no, but I've been very good at hide and seek when I was a kid. And she said, don't waste our time and we won't waste yours. Put the phone oh, down. That was, that, was end, it. that was the end of my private detective oh. career. Never worked out who she was because I was never trained as a private detective, so I never actually found out. But I worked in that milk cart. Remember, I was, I was telling Mike Parry there that he used to work in the, uh, the milk round. Were you uh, Ernie? Uh, d I drove, drove the, the fastest, fastest milk cart, cart in, in the West. West. Um, but I tell you, mate, the smell of curdled milk oh. made me so sick. Yeah. To this day, I don't drink milk. Well, I had a few jobs that came with some smells and all sorts of experiences. I mean, I remember being a waitress um, trying to save money for a, for a school sports yeah. trip. And I saw how they washed the salad that they put on the plates with the baguettes. and They just put it into the sink, which was already filthy. And, uh. you know, but also the way people spoke to waitresses and, you know, I just always treat waiting staff. Yes. With yes. But would you never say as a waiter, see, this is the thing, I hate that, I hate bad manners. If so you're if you're waiting on someone, they'd go, I beg your pardon, what did you say? I couldn't hold it back if someone Well look, yeah. I worked, never said I worked extensively thank you. in the waiting business, right? <laughs> and I'm telling you this, don't annoy a waiter or waitress. <laughs> yeah. I well, agree, I think that's on your great. dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because basically there is a whole school yeah. in how they can file up your drink or your meal. And people say, so if that told him, you boy, you boy, yes. whatever, whatever. Yeah, and we'll you'd see. And you'd watch them drinking, mmm, delicious, whatever, and you thought, I'm so saying this was me, I'm saying this was other people who would do this. And um, you would say, I hope you enjoyed that because there was extra in that anyway. Get people to send in, their, um, <laughs> send in their send in their jobs, what you did as a youngster when you were starting out, because it's quite nice to reminisce about you know how you made your first pennies and and what you did. I think that'd be quite fun. GBBs at gbnews.com. Very good. I think we're going to have more of your man here after the break. Yeah, give it we'll a go. See you then. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Lee Anderson's Real World. Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, it was the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system and... So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women at actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for, for people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. Okay, so we're in a pub, Jane, Dr Jane. Uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the old tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down. But for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend. And I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So speaking from my own experience, a good two thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend.
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We're going to start the sport with um, a managerial interview after the match, and um, a lot of these can be very bland. Uh, Paul, you take up the story. This is Brendan Rodgers. It yeah. was uh, Motherwell against Celtic yesterday. Yeah, Celtic beat Motherwell yesterday. Brendan Rodgers being interviewed by uh, Jane Lewis from BBC Scotland. So it seems usual stock standard interview afterwards, but there was something that obviously upset him. He wasn't happy about something. Um, we'll, we'll play it for you, and then it's the end that is particularly patronising towards the female reporter. Now, he says there's a story being written about this group, but we'll write, write our own story. She then challenges him as if to say, well, what are you referring to? He's saying, well, you know what I'm talking about. He's obviously unhappy about something that's being said, but it's what he says at the end when he ends the interview. Have a little listen to this. There's a story being written about this group, uh, so, uh, but we will write our own story. Can you give no. us a bit more? You can't give no, us. You don't want no. to give us a bit more insight no. into that and what you mean no. by that. No, no, no. You know exactly what I mean. I'm not. I'm. Not, I'm actually not sure. I do exactly know, know okay. what you mean. Okay. Can you can you no. tell us? People might be interested to know. To, to, no, no. But but you but you're the one that's bringing that yes, up. Absolutely. So so, so can you not give okay. us some more on it? Done. Good girl. Done. Well done. Cheers. <laughs> there you go. He's done. Good girl. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> oh gee. He's laughing about the whole and it's like it sounds very pat. Good girl. Well done. And that is what people are unhappy about. But say he meant good girl. Mm. So but even so... You well, know what I'm, I'm saying? Um, uh, Brendan Rogers is from uh, Carnlock in Northern Ireland, right? right? Um, we say good girl all the time and we are admonished for it because it's not um, in, it's not contemporary. Sure. Sure. But I can honestly tell you, Northern Irish people, men, men, women, will say good girl, good boy, good lad, mm. good man. To say yeah, but, that, but saying "good girl" is is sort of little girl. It's it's belittling. Yeah. And you know, I totally get what you're saying. If you said it to me, I wouldn't take any offence. I know it's a Northern Irish turn of phrase, but the context is everything in this, isn't it? He sounds a bit annoyed. Yep. And she's not a girl. She's mm. a woman, and she's a professional woman. So you can see why it's raised some eyebrows this morning. Because if it was, even if it was, let's say it was me that was doing it, and you go, "Okay, good lad," I'd think. Patrick, it's just like when someone calls you young man. Okay, so young I man. I even think you know twice. No? Someone called me a good lad. Good yeah, but in a, in a situation, good though, boy. in a professional situation. Honestly, I can honestly tell you, yeah. Yeah. nothing would go off a, of me. I think it's mm. a Northern Irish thing, maybe. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we won't be calling you good boy at the end of your Actually, round. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> After all that, good I don't boy. mind if you say it. it. Like you say, it depends who says it, yeah. in what context. Maybe it's, uh, you know, it making a mountain out of a molehill. I can understand that people would get upset and how she would feel about the situation, but also with what Eamon says, you know... Yeah, you get it. Maybe, maybe he should think maybe a little more carefully when he knows that this is going everywhere. Do you think, Eamon, that's a possibility? Yeah, yeah, I do. I okay. do. Um, tell me this, my friend. Yes. Uh, the League Cup final yesterday, um, were you surprised Liverpool won? Was I surprised? I wasn't really surprised. I thought probably Chelsea were going to win, but uh, I wasn't terribly surprised. It's interesting when you had the debate earlier talking about young people, but when we've got uh, youngsters that are working very hard, there was a few of them that were playing for Liverpool yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Jaden Dans is 18, James McConnell, Bobby Clark 19, 20-year-old Harvey Elliott, very good result. Jurgen Klopp, the farewell tour begins right here, so good win for them. And we look forward to the FA Cup tonight, and the big highlight for you will be... Do its Maidstone away at Coventry in the sixth tier and they're the lowest placed team that are in this stage of the FA Cup since the legendary Blythe Spartans back in 1978. Amazing. So we wish Amazing. them well tonight. And we can okay. tell you that India have won the fourth test against England. Five wickets. OK, yeah, five thank wickets you, my friend. Still. Thank you very much. Pleasure. All right, don't go anywhere. Stay tuned our way. Uh, we'll be back looking at the biggest stories of the day with Dawn Neeson and Chris Akabusi in just a moment. See you there.
tired of the usual focus tested pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. So a new poll has revealed that Gen Z or Gen Z, I don't know how I'm supposed to say it, and British boys and men are more likely to believe that feminism has done more harm than good when compared with older respondents. So the polling also found that a quarter of UK males aged 16 to 29 believe it's harder to be a man than a woman, with one in five looking favourably upon controversial influencer Andrew Tate. 37% of them also agree that the phrase toxic masculinity is unhelpful. So, with Gen Z boys increasingly holding this view, has feminism done more harm than good? Let me know your thoughts. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com, tweet me at gbnews, and make sure you take part in our poll. But I'll bring you those results shortly. Going head to head on this tonight, our author and commentator Anna May Mangan and YouTuber and social media influencer Pearl Davis. Both of you, thank you very much. Pearl, I'll start with you. Has feminism done more harm than good, especially when it comes to these Gen Z boys? Um, yes, yes, it has. I, feminism really has turned into a bunch of crybaby women that want to complain that we're not given equal opportunity when really women are given more opportunity than men. Um, and so, yeah, I would say feminism is a hate group and it's a bunch of crybaby women. Uh, Anna, would you like to come back to that? Crybaby women feminism, apparently. So we've got a right lad with us tonight with Pearl, in her opinions, haven't we? How could it possibly do harm? Pearl wouldn't do... I hope you vote. I assume you do. I hope you're not chained to the kitchen sink at home. Um, I'm not sure if you've got a job. I'm sorry, I don't know very much about you. But uh, you're probably, if there's a bloke doing the same thing as you, you're probably earning less than him. So, of course, feminism is something that... It got us the vote in the first place, and it's still doing a power of good. It's just whingy men... And actually, I, I changed that. They're lads, they're not men. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. OK, going through the papers uh, with Chris and Dawn this morning. And, Chris, um, you've chosen this story inside the Telegraph, but it has to be said, it's on the front, I think, the Metro as well this morning. It was around a bit yesterday. And this is Kate McCann, yeah. um, political correspondent, works for Times Radio. And she's come out and said, although she was with colleagues at the time, she didn't yeah. tell anyone, she's, it's taken her a little while to speak up, but she thinks she had her drink spiked. Well, I mean, I, I, th I think she knows. She had a Cassandra, a, a Cassandra, someone who actually saw it happen. And the guys that spiked her drink were quite brazen, did it in public. Um, she's a public figure. What, what worries me, she's a young lady, my daughter's age, she's 35, my daughter's 35 and, and, and 40, so she has. And um, out in public, with her mates, someone sees a spike in her drink, she didn't know, she had a little sip beforehand, thinks she gets away in the cab, can't remember the cab drive home, wakes up at four o'clock in the morning on the floor in her bathroom. Now, what worries me, that could have been anywhere. Someone could have abducted her. God knows what could have happened. And it's frightening. And, and what the uh, National Police Chief Council revealed, and this is a low-ball estimate, that up to May 2023, 6,732 people had this done to them. And a dread thing, you just said that, you know, that, that she didn't dare share it with her mates. How many people excuse me, have been date raped, mm. I have not dared tell anybody what happened. It is quite frightening. Very frightening. I mean, yeah. I'm not quite sure what happened in my day. I don't remember anything like this happening no, in my I day. No, I don't. And it's very, very frightening. Very happy that she, um, you know, has spoken up, but also was OK. I mean, goodness me, if you're in that sort of state from one sip, 
Yeah. Imagine if she'd had the whole drink. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's just that doesn't bear thinking about, is yeah. it? Yeah. And the thing is, there's so much of a blame game that goes on with Isabel. So many young women are frightened to go forward in case it's like, well, are you sure you hadn't drunk too much? Are you sure you didn't yeah, do exactly. this? And it's like, well, no, actually, my drink was spiked. Just accept my word for it. Yeah, no, it's awful. Mm. Um, Dawny, this is interesting. Which dogs are in, which dogs are out? Yay. And Scotty dogs, which I suppose, if you think about it, I mean... They're used as a sort of designer label, aren't they? Radley handbags all have little Scotty yeah, dogs no, exactly. on. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of Scottish yeah. But they are now on products, the but they've gone out of fashion. They have. They're on the Kennel Club's at watch list. Uh, their data has shown that numbers of Scotty dogs are plummeting with a record low of only 406 born last year. Oh. Is that many? Is that 406. Oh, OK. Hey. So it's, not, it's not because they've gone out of fashion. Because, like, when I was here, they were quite a popular dog, but now these, like, um, multi-poo, and yeah. you know, these cockapoos, lapis, cockapoos yeah, yeah. yeah. So all these sort of mixture dogs that, um, that, that they put in their bare handbags sort of dog, uh, or French bulldogs. Oh yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. oh you love a French yeah. bulldog. I, I, they're so sweet. They look they? so they look they're they're so velvety. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're right. It's French bulldogs and cocker spaniels, which are now uh, more than sixty percent of puppy registrations. English pointers and wire fox terriers are also going out of fashion. Oh really? Uh, yeah. It's it's all the dogs that are now crossed with poodles. I mean, you can literally yeah. put everything with a poodle and they're all the trendy dogs. Yeah. There's what? a column in the eye today about, I love my dog, but I'd never get a doodle puppy again. And talking about how they researched this dog for, for ages, but they actually didn't realise how neurotic the dog would be, even though it's like really fun and hypoallergenic and good value with children and all the rest of it. Um, they had this ongoing saga with trying to make it eat. It was very fussy. So mm. they're not perfect, these doodle dogs. No, and it's not fair on the dogs. I mean, it's not natural, is it? I mean, to, they're they're not going to breed naturally, are they? And no. they, it's like we're breeding, inbreeding our dogs as fashion accessories. Yeah. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but those Scotty dogs, they, they used to be, I presume they still are, the symbol of um, that Scottish whiskey. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was, lots what was of it? brands, yeah. Uh, White and Mackay, was it? Something like that? Oh, and, and a biscuit. I don't know, but I wonder, <laughs> I wonder biscuit, are they, like were they in Yeah, short of biscuit, yeah. Well, that's they, well, I mean, evidently they were sort of like uh, US President Franklin Roosevelt, film yeah. legend Bette Davis, and they were really popular. And they were so popular. Popular. Remember Monopoly? There was oh, a yeah, Scotty the, dog. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Yes. I was always given the iron. I don't know why. I was given the top hat. Oh, oh well, like Scotty dog. Delusions of grandeur. Oh. <laughs> Never gone into oh. one of those. Always been a shark. Yeah. <laughs> Empathy machines, oh my goodness me, we're so lacking in empathy now that we have to have a cheerful robot. What's this story? Yes, Chris? Um, I, I was interested in my, when reading this because uh, on the one hand, you can think, well, how does this differ from something like Hey Siri and the Google equivalent? Basically, it is uh, an AI bot that um, is now animated and anthropomorphised into a f five foot tall. I love it. five foot tall. That's down here Tiny. somewhere. Yeah, five foot tall humanoid. Um, but actually, the idea is good, and, I, and, and when it grows into Full fledged, in, in, in say about twenty years' time, helpful. You know, they can recognise when you're anxious and and say something. You know, so, as the older generation go on to their live on their own, m many more of us are single, living on their own. Can't think why, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it might be that big laugh, <laughs> but um, you know, they're anxious. So um, maybe you need to breathe. So if you you know you're anxious. It tells you maybe you need to little breathe and give you some breathing exercise. Or there was a joke: uh, if you're uh, if you're down, why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Oh. Boom, oh. boom. See, I don't, there's one thing more annoying <laughs> than Alexa, and that is a, you know, a cheerful robot. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. call up and you're on a waiting line, on the, and it's an automated service, yeah, and if they're all important. cheerful. Yeah. Don't be mm. cheerful. No, don't be cheerful, and don't do it in an American accent. That's even more yeah, annoying. Yeah. I just want you know real, mm -hmm. authentic the sad empathy. Part, real authentic. Part of the story is real the, authentic robots. <laughs> no empathy from actual human. No, beings. no, one hundred percent. No, no, one hundred percent. It does my head, and every time you go on to some sort of helpline and. It's all these, go here, yeah. press this, wait yeah. for it. Oh, no, no, can I just have someone online, please? Yeah, oh, wherever these are going to be, and it says in, in um, health settings. Yeah. Um, well, if you're feeling ill and, and vulnerable, you need another human being to say, how are you feeling, and yeah. actually caring. You know, that's the point of this story, is that this is, in, this is invented to help certainly older people come with loneliness. Hello, how about we take care as human beings mm. of our elderly people? I agree. Well, yeah, that unfortunate ship's I mean, how many old people get put into... 
people's homes and not with their family. Yeah, I know exactly um, that. Quick, we've got a minute left. Oh. Um, Chris, what do you want to say about the departments, not the departments, to the grocery store that you shop in, Marks and Spencer's top of the league? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah well, basically, they've done very well because they... Um, customer service is great. Um, if you want to treat yourself... You know, the product itself is, is going to be great. And so they're, they're, they're top of the league. Uh, uh, there is a mixture. There's something called a savage consumer. So you're going to mix You're going to give yourself a little treat. Go and get yourself a Marks and Sparks, Marks and Spencers. Ten seconds. Spotted dick. <laughs> what? That's not to do with my <laughs> sell that? They used to. Oh. No, but my, my story, you pick Chris's. Oh, we've second. only got eight seconds it, now. It's seven, 70 style dessert trolleys and desserts are coming back into fashion. I yeah. think that's great. Okay. <laughs> Don't Thank you both very much indeed. Laugh. Here's your weather <laughs> with goodbye. Jonathan. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, very good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far south east though we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off but elsewhere a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea that is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll stop pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up, turn lighter and patchy as we head throughout the day to the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we will turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney. Weekdays from 3 p.m. Do you have a. a... President in, uh, President Biden, who's not enforcing the law that was passed by Congress, President Obama, criticize him or not, actually enforced the law and, and was deporting people that had crossed illegally. Of course, President Trump enforced the law and improved the law to make sure that uh, and, and worked with Mexico to have the remain in, in Mexico policy. Biden has abandoned federal policy. In fact, he's deliberately trying to let in as many immigrants as possible. More, for, for the Democrats, more is better and less is racist. Just astonishing. And the statement that um, Greg Abbott put out is really feisty stuff. He said the federal government has broken the contract between the United States and the state of Texas. And in the, the eye numbers, Greg, are simply eye-watering. Six million illegal immigrants have crossed our southern border in just three years. Governor Abbott says that's more than the population of 33 
states that's in right. the United States. Astonishing numbers. And, and Martin, that's just Texas. If you add Arizona and other border states, you know, it's pushing 10 million. By the end of Biden's term, it'll be 11 million. A study by Yale University a few weeks ago, uh, three very liberal professors that did the study estimate there's 22 million illegal aliens. So this is a, a crisis that was created by the by Biden. It's it's what he wants. They want un, unfettered access to to the border. They're letting them in. It's it's a real hardship on the on the working people of Texas and other border states. And now it's a real hardship on cities that the federal government, as well as the governors of Texas and other states, are sending some of the migrants to those so-called sanctuary cities. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's fast approaching 9 o'clock. It's Monday the 26th of February. Are you tuned into breakfast online, on digital, on TV, on radio? This is GB News with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Divisions within the Conservative Party deepen as the Prime Minister brands Lee Anderson's comments unacceptable and wrong. However, one former party chairman hits out arguing the Tory party has been dragged into the gutter. Labour plans to turbocharge British house building to build a new patriotic economy, but will it be enough? We'll be speaking to the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds, in just a moment. Levelling up in action or another broken promise, government announces a £4.7 billion local transport fund for the North and the Midlands. The whole point is it's not for ministers to set those priorities, it's for councils to set them. We think those decisions are better made closer to the people that are going to benefit from them. A critical juncture for Israel's ceasefire talks taking place in Paris as Prime Minister Netanyahu doubles down on a possible Rafa assault. Earlier we spoke with Israeli politician and diplomat Ambassador Danny Dannon. It's not about revenge. It's about our future, about our security. We are determined to do whatever is necessary to prevent another October 7th. It's a fine start to the week for many of us with some sunny spells on offer, but how long will it last for? Join me later to find out all the details. Uh, top story this morning is the riot over the claims of Islamophobia and the Conservative Party deepen. Uh, according to The Telegraph, leaked WhatsApp messages from some Tory MPs have raised concerns about Mr Anderson's suspensions. MPs fear they could see a revolt from voters who will now move to the Reform Party after being flooded with supportive messages about Lee Anderson. However, Baron Baroness Saeed Varsi, a former party chairwoman and first Muslim cabinet member, now appear in the House of Lords, has accused the Conservatives of being dragged into the gutter as she criticises the party's response to this latest crisis. Well, earlier we spoke to the Transport Secretary, that's Mark Harper, and why Lee Anderson had the whip removed. This is what he had to say. I think what Lee Anderson said about the Mayor of London was wrong. And the reason, and he was given the chance to retract those comments, and to apologise for making them. He didn't do so, and that's why the whip was removed very swiftly, and I think that was the right decision. And those sentiments have been echoed by the Prime Minister this morning, who has said that uh, those words were not acceptable, they were wrong, uh, but he has denied that the Conservative Party has Islamophobic tendencies. OK, well, let's uh, speak to Annalise Dodds now. And, uh, Shadow Secretary, uh, first of all, good morning to you. Very nice to see you. It's a big day for you. And before we, we talk about uh, house building and a, a new patriotic economy, uh, can we get your, your thoughts first on MP safety? Yes, of course. Good morning. Well, of course, the, the safety of members of parliament is very important, as indeed of all public actors. And in fact, I think we've talked before about the nature of uh, social media as well. So, you know, I'm certainly very grateful uh, to both the parliamentary authorities and, of course, the police for all the work that they do 
around this. You know, I think it's really important that MPs are able to actually have a dialogue with their constituents. That's really important to me. Uh, I also think that protest is very important. Of course, it cannot then become intimidation and threats. And, you know, I think that's where the, uh, where the clear red line is. Speaking of intimidation, um, there are lots of questions about the role that your party leader had last week uh, before a key uh, vote, opposition day vote for the SNP. Um, lots of criticisms also of the Speaker of the House, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Um, it's possible that we might see this vote returning at some point. What assurances can you give um, to people watching this morning that we won't see a repeat of those scenes that happened in Parliament last week? Well, I can give you a cast iron in, uh, uh, assurance that there was absolutely no undue pressure at all from the Labour Party around what took place last week. Um, I did certainly share, I think, the public's concern at the scenes that we saw when we saw, of course, lots of MPs walking out of the chamber. I think that was incredibly disappointing because these are really important issues. You know, there's many people in our country who are desperately concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. It is important that Parliament is able to give a view on this. And obviously last week, Labour tried to build a consensus around that. That was why we set out that motion, which we believed could actually provide consensus around these issues. Unfortunately, however, you know, both the Conservatives and the SNP decided, as they say, to walk out of the chamber. I don't think that was the House of Commons at its best. I don't want to see that kind of thing happening again. And so, you know, obviously, if the issue does come back again to be discussed in Parliament, we again would be seeking consensus. We think it's important that on these issues, foreign policy issues, that we actually have an approach from the UK which is based on consensus and which enables us to use our role, really, our diplomatic role, to its full potential. So talking about diplomatic, um, to, you, you've, you've tweeted out, um, because perhaps because Conservatives still refuse to adopt the definition used by every other major political party in Britain, obviously referring to Lee Anderson here. And your question is, why are senior Conservatives finding it so hard to call out Islamophobia? What, what is this um, uh, definition used by every other major political party? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've, I've actually written to the Conservatives seven times about this. So this is a, a definition of Islamophobia that was created by the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, completely cross-party. So, for example, Baroness Farsi from the Conservative Party, she was heavily involved in producing that definition. It sets out how uh, Islamophobia, uh, sorry, Islamophobia is a form of racism and really indicates how it can actually be tackled and you know whether we're talking about islamophobia or anti-semitism other forms of racism sexism you know, all of this is about removing unfair prejudice from our politics you know one of the things i'm really proud about with our country is that we can have that democratic debate where everyone is treated the same where it shouldn't matter what your ethnicity is or your faith is but we do still see prejudice unfortunately. That's why every party should be taking action on it. And you know, I've been really disappointed that the Conservatives have not grasped the nettle when it comes to Islamophobia. So that's why I've been taking it up with them repeatedly. Although, you know, Mark Harper this morning saying the firm and decisive leadership to take away the whip was demonstrated how seriously we take this issue. And the idea that Starmer is, is giving advice on how to take extremists out of the party has to be taken with a pinch of salt, given, you know, the history of the Labour Party and problems with anti-Semitism. And just last week as well, all the incidents in Rochdale with Azhar Ali. So it's a bit rich, isn't it, for Sir Keir Starmer to be giving advice on all of this? Well, actually, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think it's a very clear example of the difference between the parties. Keir Starmer's made it his personal mission to make sure that the Labour Party is rid of anti-Semitism. I've worked with him as party chair over the last few years on this. We've put in place a completely new complaint system. We've totally overhauled our processes and quite rightly too. And that's meant that whenever there has been any indication that any of our members, of our politicians, have been engaged 
in prejudice-based behaviour. We've immediately acted on it. We haven't hung back. Now, as I said, I've written to the Conservative Party seven times over the last three years. They've not acted on this. And that is a really clear contrast with what's happened with Labour under Keir Starmer. There is a changed Labour Party now under Keir Starmer, but we've not seen that kind of leadership, unfortunately, with Rishi Sunak. And it just seems to be that he's too weak to act on these kinds of issues. Um, Annalise, we're going to hear a lot from Keir Starmer today, and um, unfortunately we've had a lot to talk to you about as well. But w w he's talking about house building, he's talking about the, the housing problem in this country, but um, he's, he's also going to talk about a patriotic economy. W what does he mean by that? That means an economy where British people have got good jobs, where they've got money in their pocket, and where they've got a stake in the economy. And I'm sure that people watching this will appreciate that that simply isn't what people in our country have at the moment. You know, the kind of expectations that people in our country used to have, you know, that their kids would be better off than they were, that they'd have at least a slightly better quality of life. You know, the fact that their kids might be able to get on the housing ladder. You know, all of those dreams are just completely out of reach for very many people in our country. And Keir Starm is absolutely determined to change that for the future, getting Britain building, actually making sure we have those good jobs up and down the country, reforming the planning system, the many changes that he's setting out today would make that big difference to British people. And, and he's going to be joined by Angela Rayner today. A lot of people would say she hasn't acted in a particularly patriotic way, gaming the system, depriving other families of, of social housing by benefiting from a scheme that she has built her career on criticising. I'm afraid completely the opposite. I couldn't disagree with that more strongly. And I think the facts indicate that very clearly. Look, Angela Rayner has always said that it is absolutely right for people to be able, when they've been council tenants, to have that right to their own home. But Angela Rayner has also been clear that actually the system's changed radically over the years. When Angela purchased her council home, along with many others, that was back in 2007, the discount was 25%. The Conservatives have since changed it to 65% and they've not built the homes that have actually been needed while council homes have been sold off. So there's been a big difference over that period. And I think Angela's quite right, actually, to call this kind of criticism out. There shouldn't be prejudice against people who've lived in council homes and who've bought their own council homes, but there should be a system that actually enables people to live in a decent home, whether that's a council home, a social home, a genuinely affordable home, or a zoner occupiers. And that's what Labour's determined to deliver. OK, and that's the uh, the crux of the problem. Folks who want to know your view on all of that, gbviews at gbnews.com, as explained by uh, the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds. Thank you very much, Annalise. Okay. We're going to leave it there. And uh, we're going to cross her political editor, Christopher Hope, uh, in Downing Street uh, this morning. Uh, Christopher Lee Anderson leading everything that we're doing today. And I just want to say to you, my friend, there's a lot of support for him amongst our viewers and listeners. And basically, they feel, Chris, that there is a, a media onslaught against him. There is a, uh, you know, what, what you're going to report coming out of Downing Street and the, and the House. And a lot of people think, well, what if he is right? What if he is right? Why is no one examining what he's got to say? That's, that's totally right. And morning, Eamon. Um, yes, totally. And that's indeed what um, many Red Wall Tory MPs are saying. Now, Lee Anderson, of course, a former Labour councillor, became an MP in, in 2019 in Ashfield. The first time he voted Conservative was for himself. So he is one of these 107 or so Red Wall Tory MPs. Now, they've been saying on their WhatsApp groups overnight, Jill Mortimer says that uh, her, constituents, uh, her voters have told her they won't vote again after this. Uh, Red, um, Sarah Dines, Peter Gibson, 
Anderson. Others are concerned, really concerned about the treatment of Lee Anderson. His friends, uh, MPs, not him personally, his uh, MPs close to him tell me there's a double standard here. They look at remarks made by David Cameron back in 2016 when he criticised Sadiq Khan and Cameron claimed that the then London mayoral candidate back in 2016 um, had appeared again and again on platforms um, with um, uh, uh, people who may have supported IS in the past. Um, others have said the same. Zach Goldsmith, he was running against Sadiq Khan back in 2016. What the claim is by some of the allies here of Anderson is that there's a kind of class issue, that the posh boys get away with saying things like Lee Anderson said on GB News on Friday night, but Lee Anderson can't. He's a working class lad and he's getting a harder time than others might. And it seems that some viewers may feel that. As for Lee Anderson, he's at home now. He's um, having a beer last night in London somewhere. He's now an independent MP. Um, he's not planning, or as we, as we stand today, there was no plans to meet with the chief whip, Simon Hart. Um, we've heard from the PM, of course, Richie Sunak. He's up north meeting the cabinet today um, in North Yorkshire. He's made very clear. He says that Lee, Lee's comments weren't acceptable, they were wrong, and that's why the whip was suspended. Uh, he also said these comments, um, sorry, Richard Holden, the party chairman, said they fall short of standards expected. So there's a real um, division breaking up in the, in the party here between supporters, uh, red wall Tory MPs who think, why? Uh, why is he being suspended? And others who think he should have been. Chris. Chris, thank you. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll just give you a reminder of the candidates who are standing in the Rochdale by-election uh, on Thursday this week. Azar Ali's name remains on the list as the Labour candidate, although, of course, if he wins, he won't be uh, Labour. Mark Coleman, uh, Independent. Simon Danchuk, uh, Reform UK. Ian Donaldson for the Lib Dems. And Paul Ellison for the Conservatives. George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain, Michael Haworth, Independent, William Haworth, Independent, Guy Otten, Green Party, Raven Rodent, Subortna Official Monster, Raving Looney, and David Tully, Independent. Ah, some names perhaps a bit easier to pronounce. We've got Andrew and Bev coming up at half past nine, and we're looking forward to it. Good to see you, Bev. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. How, how's the show looking? Well, we've got a great guest in the first half an hour. We talked to Brendan Cox, whose wife, of course, mm -hmm. was murdered by a far-right fanatic in 2016. He's going to be talking to us about the revelation at the weekend that at least three MPs now mm. are having protection. Pr Who women would MPs. go into politics? Why would you? Honestly, it's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, it is. I'd, uh, you like to think this is something that will, in terms of politics and the threats to MPs, this is something that hopefully is will blow over when tensions in the Middle East, hopefully, at some point, mm -hmm. reduce. Because what I don't want us to move towards is, a, is being in a country where MPs can't see their constituents and they have to have wraparound bodyguards. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be really careful not to overreact and fundamentally change the way democracy it, works in this yeah, country. Sarah Vine's written in the mail today about her former husband, Michael Gove, and the man who killed David Amos, murdered David Amos, mm -hmm. Tory MP in his constituency surgery, was outside their home Terrifying. six or seven times. OK, guys, uh, we'll, we'll join you for all of that, half past nine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, up next, a man has set himself a challenge of walking 1,200 miles to Ibiza. That's next. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Are you across this microaggression story? I, I'm across microaggressions. I'm also it's across it's XL bullies. Ridiculous. You would not last five minutes. Oh, for this. God's so sake. Basically... Civil servants, give me strength. So civil servants have been taught not to roll their eyes, <laughs> something you do very well. We both do it quite a lot, actually. Because it's seen as an act of microaggression. This, By the way, this costs <laughs> the taxpayer, this yes? training, £160,000. What the hell is going on in our woke civil service?
Who Ooh. cares if someone rolls their eyes okay. in exasperation? What, <laughs> what the hell is going on in our civil service full stop if the way that civil servants are communicating with each other is rolling their eyes and looking at their phones? I mean, is the government being run by people who are essentially acting to each other like stroppy teenagers? Yeah. But I, I, I'm all right with people, mm. because, you see, I would be in defence of ro eye rolling. So me, me too, because, I couldn't care less. But do you know why? Because I want people to give me their genuine reaction. As long as it's mm. not deeply offensive, but I want to know how people feel. And what they're being told here, civil servants are being taught, and of course this is an, an area of employment law because people are taking cases against their bosses who roll their eyes at them. They're saying they're being encouraged um, to uh, say nothing and nod their heads to promote transparency and inclusion. Don't show what you really think, just nod your head. Mm. But I think that comes with then saying what you really think. And this is, this is the key problem and what these, uh, what these courses are, are trying to establish. And I looked into some of them uh, when, I was, uh, when I was researching this. And it's not saying hide what you're feeling. It's saying rather than huffing and puffing and rolling your eyes, if you've got a disagreement with someone, say I've got a disagreement with someone. But because otherwise, you can't have an effective workplace if people are sort of just passively, aggressively huffing at but each why other. Why do these civil servants need to be taught this? <laughs> Why do people need to be taught this? This is just normal discourse in a normal working day. You don't need a seminar on it. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. A very interesting story for you now is a man who set himself the challenge of walking. Walking 1,200 miles, that's 1,200 miles, all the way to Ibiza. Yeah, and he aims to complete his journey in 60 days. And his gruelling challenge is starting in Manchester and, as we say, ends in the beautiful Balearic Island, all to raise money for charity. OK. Right. Uh, so, in the studio, we now have uh, Wayne Lineker uh, and Henry Moores. And we're going to tell you how those two uh, got in touch and contacted each other. So, Henry, you're the man doing the walking. <coughs> What's Wayne got to do with all of this? A big thing for me was Wayne was the king of Ibiza. I, well, I think Wayne, Wayne was the go-to when it comes to... Um, when I planned my walk to Ibiza, I thought, there's only one man I can get in touch with, and it's Wayne Lineker. Yeah, so, and um, he sent me a DM and um, my social media manager picked it up and yeah. uh, she immediately messaged me. We've just had a crazy message from a, from a young guy saying he, he wants to walk to Ibiza. Would I support him? I'm like, yes. So we arranged a meeting and, uh, and um, I mean, the thing is, he's already walked to Paris. So, you know, otherwise I wouldn't really have took him that seriously because everyone's always joked about yeah. this thing about walking to Ibiza. And uh, so, yeah, we had the meeting and um, he talked me through his route and how he's going to do it, and he's got to run a marathon, a walk a marathon a day. But you're not you're not walking with him. You're walking part of it or some of it. I'm going to I'm going to do the first day and the last day. Yes. Oh, perfect. I'll, I'll take all the glory. Oh. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. I'll, leave the, I'll leave the tough times to him. Yeah. And, and you're doing all of this, Henry, for the Tony Hudgel Foundation, yeah. and obviously a lot of people follow the story of Tony. But for those who aren't aware of this little boy, just remind <clears> everybody <throat> what motivates you and why you care so much about it. Um, one thing for me is that I found Tony's story is incredible. I think a lot of people at home have probably read into Tony's story. It's fantastic, and what he's been through is horrible. Um, but what he's trying to do is fantastic. He's trying to, you know, help lives of other children who've been through similar situations himself. Mm. And I just think if he's able to go through what he's gone through, I'll be able to get through anything. You know, when we walk, that is, is nothing compared yeah. to what he's done. So walking a marathon a day, I mean, that sounds... Like, that's going to take you a long time. How many hours is that of walking every day, do you reckon? It's about seven and a half hours a day. God. But if I, if I could run maybe two minutes every ten minutes, it'll cut it down by a couple hours a day. OK, he's got so, a strategy. Yeah, I've got, it, I've got it all planned out. You have to. <laughs> is that not cheating? No, you're supposed to walk. <laughs> well, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. You do it, then. <laughs> and obviously support is going to be good. It'd be like a, it'd be like a gale force wind behind you to blow you along if yeah. you've got yeah. people turning out and people supporting you and you knowing that people are there behind you. Yeah, I had it last time, obviously, when I went to Paris, I had maybe 20, 30 people overall 
this time I expected it to be much bigger. And that was, like you say, that, that got me to the finish line. You couldn't do it without them people. And what time of year are you planning to do this? Because obviously, Wayne, you're <clears> only in Ibiza for the for the good season. Yeah. So you want to be, you know, arriving when what the, the bar, yeah, the club's we, all we, up and we running. Have, we have a plan. Um, all right. So I've got Lineker's bar there. And yeah. on the 16th of, of June, it's the first Euro Championship okay. game in Serbia. So we've timing it so that Henry turns up an hour before kickoff with a bar full of people, all, all English football yeah. fans, all cheering him in. But, um, <coughs> yeah, he, re he, he will leave on the... Uh, Ju is it uh, April the 12th? 16th, yeah, 12th, 12th 16th. And he will arrive on uh, June the 16th. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah... That's well, you know, one thing we'll do, we should be at the other end, or we, we'll have you and a link at the other end yeah, to tell us that you're there, that'll, that'll be safe so and sound, yeah. yeah. everything great. accomplished. Um, we, we do have to say, uh, with your very distinctive surname, you are indeed the brother of Gary. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> are you the younger brother or the older brother? Or well, just the wild I'm, brother. Uh, I'm the wild brother, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, every... bless him, we're chalk and cheese, me and Gary, you know, we're two different people, but, um, yeah. I guess we've both been successful in dis different areas, but, uh, but yeah. But I have to say, every time I'm on holiday somewhere, and there'll always be, oh, uh, Wayne Lineker's got a bar around here, or got a club yeah. round here, whatever it is. You're very well known yourself, aren't you? I seem to be at the moment, yeah. I've, uh, my, my face gets around quite a bit, because people, it's a thing in Ibiza now to take a... You've not been to Ibiza unless you've had a picture with Wayne Lineker. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. I've never <laughs> been to Everywhere Ibiza, I've got a picture this morning. Picture, so, yeah. um, just yeah. quickly, Henry, how much are you hoping to raise and how can people support you if they want to? So, if people want to support me, they can head over to the Just Giving page. Um, the total we expected to raise was £10,000. That got surpassed late, uh, yesterday by a lady. Yeah, in one uh, day. Called wow. Eloise. She donated £9,600 last night. So yeah. that's got surpassed last night. So I think the sky's the limit. Well, he's Henry Moores. Google him, look him up, see what he's doing, help him in his cause. It's well worthwhile. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. Thank and you thank Wayne. you, Wayne. Much, thank you, much appreciated to both yeah, of you. Good luck. Thank you. We'll be Hello there, there, good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is quite a nice fine start to the week for many of us and that is thanks to this ridge of high pressure that has begun to topple its way in across areas of the UK. In the far southeast though we do still have low pressure lingering on first thing so there is still some rain for the likes of East Sussex and Kent and it could take into the afternoon for that to properly clear its way off but elsewhere a good number of sunny spells. Quite a brisk northeasterly wind coming in off the North Sea that is going to make it feel quite cold. We'll start pushing some showers for northeastern areas of England and eastern Scotland as well. So whilst it will feel cold, temperatures on the thermometer though, generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. A fine end to the day for many of us as well, some clear intervals underneath that. Temperatures will begin to plummet their way off, so certainly some frost and patchy fog developing tonight, particularly for central eastern areas of Wales and England. Temperatures will actually rise into the second half of the night for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, so we see the winds begin to strengthen and the rain begin to arrive later on in the night. We'll then watch as this band pushes its way south eastwards over the course of the day, falling a snow over the highest mountains of Scotland, but the band will tend to break up, turn lighter and patchier as we head throughout the day to so the far southeast, staying dry for most. And we will turn brighter in the northwest later on as well with some sunny spells and scattered showers. Temperatures again generally between 7 and 10 degrees Celsius. We hold on to a fairly changeable and unsettled theme throughout the rest of the week as well, so do prepare for further rain at times. Bye bye. Well, as the topic of whether MPs are safe or not is on all the headlines today, who better to talk to uh, than Brendan Cox, who has literally lived that nightmare when he lost his wife, Joe? And we could have breaking news with Lee Anderson. Um, a GB News presenter, of course, has had the whip withdrawn over his remarks about Islamists and them running the London show. Mm. So stay tuned to that. And also... Why will young people not apply for jobs, not even turn up to the jobs they do apply for? Let us know what your, what your reasoning is behind that. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.